Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second half of the uh, 2022 Fitch Colloquium. My name is Jorge Otero Pailos. I'm professor and director of the Historic Preservation Program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Um, we are coming back from the longest break ever in a conference, a, a break of 11 hours. Um, if you are in New York or in the United States, you went to sleep after our conference last night. But if you were in China, uh, good evening to all of you. Um, you had a very long day between the morning session and then tonight's evening session. Um, the Fitch Colloquium honors the memory of our uh, founder, the Columbia University Historic Preservation Program's founder, Fitch, uh, James Marston Fitch, um, a, a, an incredible figure that traveled the world and thought broadly about preservation uh, and was interested in all aspects of preservation from architectural design to policy questions, to historical research, to materials research and technology. Quite an extraordinary figure. And it's that legacy that, that we honor today. And in today's symposium, uh, is particularly relevant uh, as well because it is in collaboration, it is organized in collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, but for those of you that were not here, um, this symposium really began uh, in dialogue with uh, Martino Cierli and Evangelos Cotzioris, who have um, curated an exhibition in MoMA called Reuse, Renew, Recycle, Recent Architecture from China, which is on view through July 4th, about which Evangelos will talk a little bit more um, in a second. Um, before I turn to Evangelos, I just wanna do a little recap of, uh, of yesterday's, um, of yesterday's uh, conference. Uh, we heard yesterday from uh, uh, Zhong Ke, from Xu Tiantian and from Philip Yuan, beautiful uh, projects dealing with heritage and many different levels. And in some ways we were looking to understand through those presentations, the forces underlying the turn in China to preservation, Chinese architecture to preservation. There has been a marked turn from an emphasis on new construction, uh, in symbolic buildings to preservation uh, in China. And we wanted to take note of it and understand what are the forces underlying this, this turn. And we learned yesterday about many of those forces, what is activating this turn. And in particular, we heard a lot about the social issues that are, are driving this, this turn grappling with, in a sense, some of the outcomes of the uh, incredible construction boom that happened in China in the, last, um, in the last 40 years, but in particular, with particular intensity in the last 20. Um, we heard about the social issues being really, uh, as a result of construction, things like displacement, social displacement. And we saw that kind of displacement both in cities and in rural areas. And we've seen attempts that really start at the government level with uh, different policies being set up to address and repair these social problems. And architects responding, giving expression to, to these policies and trying to address them at various levels. We saw, for example, the upgrading of vernacular housing to contemporary living standards, both in cities and in rural areas, and a particularly poignant example with hutongs of Zongke. Um, we also saw uh, new modes of cooperative businesses, the creation of these cooperatives to support family-owned craft businesses like, like tofu and, and sugar, to bring them up to contemporary health standards, but also to aggregate them so that, for example, packaging becomes easier, mar marketing becomes easier. Um, um, and we saw some amazing projects by Xu Tianxian on, on that. Um, and these projects are really trying to preserve not just architectural heritage, but they're also trying to preserve these intangible traditional practices and giving them 
uh, new locations, new sites for them to practice. And then we saw a very interesting now rise of a new tourist economy, internal tourist economy to China, where urban um, uh, travelers, urban tourists are going to rural sites to see how these traditional crafts are carried. Of course, another social issue is that um, there's been mass migrations from rural areas. So actually some of these crafts <clears throat> don't have enough people to be carried out. So the question of uh, labor force becomes uh, a real issue. And we saw the uh, attempts uh, to create new robotic tools to carry out these crafts, to assist the local craftsmen in, in a hybrid mode. So not to replace craftsmen, but to actually help them do the work um, in light of the fact that there's just fewer, um, fewer people to do it. And we saw Philip Yuan, for example, with his um, interest in woodworking, um, uh, uh, helping us understand how that can be a form of assistance to local crafts. Now we're familiar with, you know, now motorized tools and pneumatic hammers uh, and so on in construction sites in the United States. So, uh, and around the world, in fact, and those kinds of uh, attempts to introduce uh, uh, um, robotics tools uh, really go back to the 19th century in, in, in the United States. So this is, let's say, one more, one more uh, step in, along that way. And it was interesting to hear Philip Yuan talk about the sense that the future for him is a hybrid future between humans and robots kind of uh, working together. We also saw a very interesting discussion about materials and uh, both the combination of traditional and and more contemporary materials. Uh, there was a beautiful project with Zhang Ke of introducing the most traditional and beautiful of, of Chinese materials, ink, um, uh, which is at the heart of a whole tradition of uh, painting and of, 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 of writing uh, and script uh, and introducing that ink in different ways into architecture through by mixing it with concrete. Uh, and that was very interesting. We also saw the real kind of interest in traditional wood construction and adapting, reviving some of that wood construction in the work of Xu Tianxian, but also of reinventing it and rethinking it um, across all of the projects. I'm sure some of these issues, some of these ideas are going to um, going to come up today as well. And before I introduce the speakers, who I, I'll be introducing them one by one uh, today. Uh, but just to give you, I mean, just a telegraph, we're going to hear from uh, Dong Gong, Wan Hui, uh, Lu Wenyu, and Pei Weiyi, Chloe today. I'll be again giving you a better introduction of each of them uh, uh, before they speak. Uh, both the speakers yesterday and the speakers today are um, really superstars in world architectural and in world uh, preservation architecture. And we are just so uh, honored and delighted that they have all agreed to participate and share their uh, ideas and thoughts with us. Um, after the, not, not some of them have been included in the um, uh, exhibition at MoMA, but not all of them. Uh, so I will now turn the virtual podium over to Evangelos to uh, tell us a little bit about the exhibition at MoMA and uh, which was the spark for this conference. Good morning, Jorge, and thank you for this introduction. Thank you also to everybody joining from around the world. So good evening to those in China and other parts of the world. Uh, I'm going to say a couple of words about the exhibition Reuse, Renew, Recycle, Recent Architecture from China, which is currently on view on the first floor of the Museum of Modern Art here in New York, and was co-curated by Martino Stierli, the Chief Curator of Architecture and Design, and uh, me. Um, this is a small exhibition that uh, showcases uh, eight projects from the last decade, more or less, um, of architectural production in China, uh, that really share a number of common threads, which, which are namely the idea of reusing existing buildings or renewing urban infrastructure or recycling materials. 
And even though it is really kind of focusing on the, as a case study almost on Chinese architectural production, uh, both of us believe that um, it's a remarkable kind of uh, set of projects and practices and strategies uh, that architects from many different parts of the world can, can learn from. Uh, I wanted to, sh to start by showing you just this introductory, uh, introductory wall into the exhibition, which uh, speaks also to the multiplicity of uh, uh, practices represented um, in, in the show. And to give you also kind of a, a glimpse or a peek into the actual side of the installation, uh, you'll notice that there is, uh, um, not, not only is there a multiplicity of practices represented, but also a multiplicity of media that speak again to the tools and processes that uh, many of these architects that we have been in conversation employ. So um, preservation is really one of the dimensions that uh, runs through this uh, exhibition. And what is perhaps commendable to, to note is that uh, preservation or historic preservation of structures and buildings is not meant as a means to an end, or it doesn't come as a mandate, but is in most cases actually proposed by the architects themselves as a way of uh, creating communities that are um, embedded in their context and create a kind of cultural continuity for them. Um, I just wanted to point out also uh, very briefly, without giving away too much information, two of the uh, architects uh, that are uh, part of this panel today, and we'll hear more from them. Uh, the first one is Vector Architects and, and Dong Gong's uh, work for the Alila Yangshuo Hotel in Guilin, uh, which really speaks to the ways in which uh, more humble structures like uh, that of a sugar factory can be uh, become part of development for a region. In this case, part of the hospitality industry in a very kind of uh, re interesting and uh, you know uh, uh, sustainable manner. Uh, or the work of uh, Wang Xu and Lu and Yu of Amateur Architecture Studio, uh, whose work really, I think, has set the groundwork for many of the younger members of, of the current generation of Chinese practitioners working in this vein. Uh, here, for instance, you see uh, one of their material studies for the Jinghua Ceramic Pavilion on the left, uh, which is an older project um, than the others in this show, but really kind of speaks to this intense interest in um, you know materiality and craftsmanship and how those ideas of um, uh, architectural practices can be brought to the present through translation and really on the on the right the project one of the two projects that they will be discussing today uh, the Wenchun village and your Hangzhou which um, proposes a repertoire of interventions um, in a depopulating village and I will not uh, say much more than that I also wanted to mention that Urbanos and the work of Wang Hui, who is one of the speakers, uh, is not perhaps included in this installation that you see on your screens, but is represented in MoMA's collection through the Tulu Collective Housing Project from 2005, 2008, uh, which uh, reinvents and reinterprets the communal dwelling type of um, the uh, Tulu housing, uh, which is unique to the Hakka people. Uh, and today they're going to talk about uh, a different project that is also extremely uh, fascinating. And we also look forward to, to hearing, of course, from Pei Wei Wei, uh, Wei, Wei Chloe and uh, her work on the Shuzhang uh, Heritage Park in Beijing. Uh, on that note, I wanted to also thank uh, the Historic Preservation Program at Columbia GSAP, uh, Jorge Teropilos and Sarah Grace Goodwin for giving us uh, this opportunity to collaborate and uh, uh, unpack some of these uh, dimensions that uh, uh, our exhibition hopefully has provided a starting point for. And I would also uh, encourage everybody who has the possibility to visit the exhibition in New York to do so uh, until July 2nd, uh, when will be the closing date for this exhibition. And on that note, uh, we very much look forward to today's presentations and discussions, and uh, I'm sure that will be as exciting and prolific as yesterday's. Thank you, Evangelos. Um, uh, it, it's a wonderful exhibition. I encourage everyone to go see it. Um, I think one of the things that is, is an obvious thing, but it bears repeating, is that so much of uh, American academia you know, has been influenced by, by Chinese students and the influx of Chinese students in recent decades. Um, they have been the bridge that has really educated us as faculty as to um, this amazing work and this uh, incredible traditions of, of Chinese um, architecture and preservation. 
the, of course, there has always been some kind of bridge, some kind of connection between the United States and China. Uh, there is a long history of Chinese immigration to America. And that, of course, uh, we have a lot of Chinese American students in our program uh, who also contribute uh, to our to the understanding of the enormous contributions that the Chinese um, have made to the development of the United States of America. And I want to thank Chris Kumarjaja, who is a, a great activist of that, but so many others um, in, in, our, uh, in our program, uh, Clara Yip and others who constantly remind us of, of those contributions. But in particular, uh, I think it is important in this conference to really acknowledge, and I did so yesterday, but I want to do it again, acknowledge the role that our current Chinese students have played in organizing this conference. Um, they are just a terrific force. They're incredibly smart. Um, and they're the ones that really we had discussions with them about, you know, identifying the leading uh, voices in China working on on preservation and, and architecture. So I want to thank thank them, uh, Luxi Yan, Xu Yi Yin, uh, Ziming Wang, Daxing Shen, uh, Xi Yu Li, Ying Ye Tian, Hong Ye Wang, Wenji Shui, Zihao Zong, uh, Xu Ya Zhao, Jianning Wei, and Ye Xu. Um, I also want to thank, of course, Sarah Grace Godwin and the GSAP events team. Sarah Grace is a program manager for historic preservation and the GSAP events team, including Stefan Bodeker, Lucy Kresbach, um, and, uh, and the rest. And Chris, of course, who joins us today. So thank you all. Um, uh, thank you, of course, again to Martino and Evangelos for your collaboration in this. This is just, it's been a really amazing first day and we're about to then turn over to our second day with the first presentation by Dong Gong, who is a founder of Vector Architects. He has, uh, was elected as the foreign member of the French Academy of Architecture in 2019. He's been success, uh, successively employed as design tutor at Tsinghua University and Central Academy of Arts distinguished visiting professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a visiting professor at the Polytechnic University of Turin, and indeed a, a really a world figure um, uh, in, his, uh, in, in, in his work, not only in China, but in his pedagogical uh, practice. Uh, he and Vector Architects have been invited to various major exhibitions showcasing their work, including the first Chinese architecture exhibition uh, at MoMA, the 2018 Free Space Venice Biennale as well, and many others, but we don't have time to get into them. But Dong Gong's practice has earned international recognition by his representative works, including the Seashore Library, Seashore Chap Chapel, Alila Hotel in Yangshuo and the renovation of the captain's house in Changjian Art Museum. The everyone's CVs is uh, a very, very lengthy and illustrious. So we are just, it's, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And so without further ado, I turn the virtual podium over to Dong Gong um, and, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to be part of this symposium. I'm going to share the screen first. So can you see me? Can you see the screen? Yes, it's perfect, thank you. Great, okay. So, yeah, I noticed this keyword of this uh, entire discussion, a symposium, is the preservation. And I do think it's a very sensitive and meaningful issue, especially in China in the current moment, because you might know that, you know, China has been undertaking this drastic urbanization process for the past 30 to 40 years. So literally this entire country is in the progress of transforming into some new state. So how we deal with this relationship between new and old become a very crucial issue. 
for architecture people. So today, uh, my topic of the presentation will be the evolution of a place. It's basically about a story about a factory, which is a factory, uh, it's a sugar mill factory built about 60 or 70 years ago and generation by generation, step by step, uh, transform into uh, current uh, current uh, cultural icon in, in in China. So I'm basically will introduce the story and sharing some of my understanding about the preservation uh, throughout the presentation process. Uh, this project is basically located in Guangxi, which is in the southern part of China and closer to uh, tropical uh, climate area. And that the right spot is the location of the project. And uh, there is a very powerful factor about the site because if you see the red line on the screen, is uh, the property line of the project. And it's uh, right along a very famous river in China, it's the uh, Lijiang River. And uh, it's supposed to be a number one beautiful. Uh, water scenery river in Chinese people's mind. And uh, together with the river, this is a typical karstic geographical district. So when you see the this picture, you can have a sense of how beautiful this mountain and water landscape is. And besides this uh, beautiful scenery, we do have another very important factor, which is the sugar mill factory right over here. And this factory was built around 1960s. And throughout the history, it has a different stages, which I will elaborate later on. And this is almost like an iconic uh, angle to see this factory together with this beautiful mountain around the factory. And eventually, actually, our design concept has a lot to do with how we deal with this factory as a center uh, dominating role together with the surrounding beautiful mountainscape and also the, the river in front of it. So majorly two important uh, relationships, relationship with the factory and the relationship with the natural landscape. The factory was a very important industrial facility back to the time when it was built. This is a very interesting image. It was uh, 1972, which actually is a year I was born. The factory became the cover page of the National Military Magazine. So you can have a feeling that how important and that the, the, the high class the factory was back to that time. But unfortunately, uh, all the way to the end of 1980s, because of the national policy of this environmental protection, the factory was uh, shut off. And it's uh, becoming abundant structure in the suburb of Yangshuo County. And this series of pictures just give you uh, the condition after uh, the, the close off of the factory, the condition of the entire uh, architecture structure. In the early, uh, actually in the early 20, uh, uh, in the early 2000, uh, what our client, they drove by along the Yangshuo County and very uh, coincidentally, they see the structure and they fell in love with the structure because of the beautiful atmosphere, uh, the architecture together with the mountain around that. So they invited uh, a Shanghai architect, his name is Zhao Chongxin, to give a very preliminary and basic repair of the entire structure. So I really appreciate his work back to almost like 15 years ago because he did a very slight and a very accurate touch 
to the original structure. He didn't too, do too much about this architectural expression as designer, but he just simply reinforced the structure and also replace some component of the eroded portion of the of the building. And starting uh, in 2013, I was uh, involved in the project, which uh, the client made up the decision. They try tried to transform the entire structure into a hotel. And I was fortunate in the beginning of my design progress, when I went to Yangshuo, I had this chance to have a, a lunch together with some uh, elderly people uh, who worked in this factory when they were young. And that they start talking about a lot of stories and the experience, try to memorize you know, the, the, the moment when they work in the factory. And for me, it's a, it's a great learning process about this uh, physical structure. It's not only architecture heritage of the local area, but at the same time, it's, it's almost like a, a emotional link or emotional identification for some people living in the area. So this will, also has a big impact in our later design process. Yeah. And we started design progress with the hand sketches. This is my personal method to start, learn from the site, to discover the important things and build up this emotional interaction between architect and the place. So uh, some of the design decision actually were made along uh, right on the site instead of uh, in the uh, architect isolated in the office. And that's typical way of uh, our work uh, method in vector architects. And this is almost uh, represent the eventual layout of the entire compound. And no matter what we do, because we have to, we made up the decision that we keep the original factory, and then we transform them, them into some public programs like uh, libraries, like cafeteria, uh, dining area, and uh, a bar, uh, and et cetera. And then we have to add new volumes into this compound to fulfill the functional requirement. But no matter what we do, we still keep the factory volumes, original volumes in the center area. So the new volume become a flunking wings alongside the original structure. Yes, this is a very important relationship because we want to still keep the original structure as the dominating role of the entire compound. Of course, we went through a very uh, thorough consideration about the different possibilities about the master plan. So from the elevation, also you can see the central part, it's still the factory and the new volumes is alongside. And uh, we tried to design some sequential space uh, inside the new volumes, but we keep it simple. We keep the profile simple and clean, try to make a harmonic relationship between old and new. And that's the eventual uh, master plan, a uh, first floor plan of the entire compound. But this is the center uh, part, which is the original factory. And they are checking room and they are restaurant and, and so forth. And these are two new volumes alongside. And we made up this landscape reflecting pond in the front of the entire compound. And at the same time, it's a fire distinguished water pond. And then this is the corner of Li Jiang. We have an original truss connect the entire compound to the river. This is a picture showing, showing you how beautiful this original factory, the, the facade, the material was. 
And uh, one of our design task is try to build up something has relationship with the old, the, between the new and old, but we have to make sure the new also represent the current technology and ter current aesthetic value. So we, we actually went through uh, a, a design process, try to achieve that. And this is one of the early sketches about this wall section. So eventually we made up this design decision. We use concrete blocks. It's also a masonry stacking uh, detailing logic. It has uh, a similar scale with the original brick, and it has a similar logic about the construction detail because it's all always stacking. But because of the concrete could carry out a, a different kind of material quality, it can take more light and the ventilation, the air into the surface and to make the inside space has a better quality for living. So from this very uh, early design model, the, the surface is made of this concrete block, but we try to make the surface light in terms of the, the sense of weight and it allow more light and air to go through. And from this appearance, it shows a kind of certain translucency of the materiality. And this is the model in the schematic phase. And then gradually the scale of the model is getting bigger because we, we have to make, make sure we made the right design decision by making the large scale model. And this model is one-to-one -one mock up in our office. It's not in the construction site. And we try to use form to uh, uh, test this opacity and also the scale of the material. And then uh, finally, we went through this process of manufacture. And we actually, the client and us try to find a collaborator uh, who is the, the professional manufacturer. But eventually, we failed because of the limit of the budget and also the difficulty of the transport transportation later on. So at that moment, our client made a very bold but very smart decision that he tried to build up his own factory just right on the site to really make the block by the local people, by the local team. So this, I include uh, several images showing you uh, the process of how we uh, did the study and the research and the eventually fabricate this concrete block by the team on the site. They invent some machines, try to pull the block outside the, the formwork. This is the picture showing that particular step. And this is the, uh, the condition of that small factory. And behind is our, uh, the structure of the building. It's a construction site. This is a typical process. So we have a formwork made by a PVC and then they have to lay the rebar. It's very thin, but it's almost like a, a cast in place concrete. And eventually they pour the concrete inside this formwork, the mold, and then they grind the surface and eventually to push out this, uh, this concrete block by this uh, small machine they invented by themselves. And this is the, the process of stacking. Uh, this is actually uh, in the construction site. So there are uh, uh, some very particular thought of this detail. I won't uh, go too much into detail. But uh, you can see how they incorporate the rebar inside the masonry wall and all, all such effort. So it's a, it's a combination of architect together with uh, the local worker. We, collab we collaborate together and try to find a solution. And during the process, we uh, always have a, one architect to really live on the site and working together with the team of the construction. 
So it's uh, really about the co-working process uh, between the architect with the local workers. And this, that's the final outcome of the material. Even though it's made by this very heavy material, be, but because of the, 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 the process, uh, we try to control a sense of light, lightness in the eventual uh, result. And that's at the twilight condition when the light comes from inside, it becomes a, almost like a lantern uh, effect. I will show you a short clip to uh, tell the story about this entire construction process. And this is actually back to 15 years ago when the client went to the site and they take the air balloon to fly to the sky and then look at the site from above. That's the, the site. So this start the foundation work. They're full of stones underneath the building. It's almost like the extension from the mountain aside. That's the pouring concrete. Install the formwork. We have this large piece of this wood formwork because we try to reduce the joint of the, of the construction on the concrete surface. So sometimes the entire space is one form. And that's the machine I mentioned earlier, pushing the concrete block outside of the mold. That's actually uh, how we test the strength on site of the concrete block. But of course, we have a structure consultant. But this is just double check. And that's the topping of the structure. And below, uh, at the bottom is the site. And then you can see how beautiful this karstic landscape. And that's the stacking process. And that's myself and our uh, interior designer, Jubin, on the site. That's the fence work around the compound. He actually knock off some of the lock because they made some mistake. That's the installation process of a bamboo shelter inside the building. Jubin and myself designing the location of trees.
that's actually the opening ceremony back to three years ago, 27, five years ago. Manic fireworks. Almost like a battlefield. But very next day, we encountered a big flood in the local area, the Yangshuo County, and the entire county was flooded. And uh, I was told it's almost like the most serious flood during the recent 50 years. So you see, this is the road in front of the, the hotel, and it's becoming a river. So the hotel actually closed off for closed off because the basement is flooded. So they repaired for another three months, and after three or four months, they reopened the entire compound. And that's the moment they reopened in the October of the same year after four months of the flood. So no matter how noisy the entire process is, how complicated we go through, eventually it's becoming a peaceful place. I think that's probably the most rewarding moment for architect. I noticed that I probably already exceed the time limit, but please allow me to use another very short video clip to give you a sense about what's the current condition of the hotel compound. That's the reflecting pond in the center of the entire compound. And that's the almost like a cathedral. It's the old factory. And that's a cut in path inside the water pump. This is the hallway connected uh, the front desk room to the typical the guest room building walling. So it's an outdoor space covered by the concrete shelter. That's a sequential 
space inside the new volume. That's the bamboo installation in one of the open terrace inside the new volume. Actually, the truss is also from the original old structure, and we transformed this place into a swimming pool in front of the Lijiang River and looking to the distance of the mountains. And that's the camera uh, flying above the water and look back to the entire compound. Okay. So I'm done with this uh, presentation. I think we can leave more time uh, for the further discussion later on. Jorge, I will give the floor back to you. Thank you, Dong Hong. What Thank a you. what an amazing project. What a what an inspiring what an inspiring presentation. So much to talk about. We will return to uh, to comments. I just want to tell everyone in the audience, please. There is a Q and A button. Write your questions and comments down there, and we will address them in the in the discussion session um, afterwards. We now turn to uh, Wang Hui, co-founder of Urbanist Architecture in Design. Um, Wang Hui is um, is one of the most visionary um, 
architectural designers in China working with historic buildings. He's really um, developed a whole practice around engaging with historic uh, um, architecture and historic sites. He's a council member of the Architectural Society of China, also teaches. Uh, he's a studio master at the School of Architecture at Tsinghua University and a visiting professor at the Center for Architecture Research and Design at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, as a design philosophy, he's going to talk a little bit more about that, but he, he's really uh, developed a whole methodology for balancing um, the urbanization of China uh, with, with uh, the new urbanization, with the old historic monuments um, that, that, um, that are, let's say, uh, uh, absorbed by this uh, urbanization and to explore new spatial solutions to really bring, rec you know, reconcile these conflicts between the old and new. And in fact, the kinds of urban life that takes place between this, this new uh, kind of development. Some of his recent projects focus on new ways of revitalizing ignored historic monuments, and they've aroused uh, very interesting debates um, in Chinese historic preservation circles. Uh, some of those examples are the environmental upgrade of the Five Dragon Temple and the Holy Flame Plaza at the Shi Hu Du relics. So without further ado, I'll turn the virtual podium over to Wang Hui, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Prokhi. Um, thank you for your inf uh, invitation and uh, your introduction. And uh, so let me share the screen. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, so it's my great honor uh, and pleasure uh, to participate in this column uh, Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, it's uh, we can, but we it's not the um, we see the whole PowerPoint slide now. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So my presentation is to concentrate on one small environmental design um, for a very tiny small heritage. Uh, so dimension wise, uh, this heritage is only eight by fourteen meters, and uh, it was constructed um, in the year. 831, um, more than a thousand years ago. Um, it was in the end of the Tang Dynasty, uh, which is the, the highlight of the China's uh, civilization. Uh, so this tiny um, building, uh, actually, you know, it doesn't seem uh, that much great. Uh, if, if you don't know Chinese architecture that much, but if I show you this timeline, it is actually occupied a very, very uh, important position of all these kind of existing um, timber architectures. So it is um, the second oldest existing uh, timber architecture in China today, and uh, the, uh, the oldest Taoist temple in China. Um, the building is located in Shanxi province, um, but uh, also if we look at uh, this, um, timeline of the world architecture uh, is also very interesting that uh, this timeline actually is in the middle of some, is in between uh, the decline of the Roman Empire and the uh, revival of the city culture uh, in the 11th century of the medieval age. Uh, so during this period uh, in the Western world, it is called Dark Age or whatever. Uh, so which means, you know, the civilizations was almost not there. But uh, in the Eastern world, we have this magnificent temples. And uh, so this is one of three uh, existing remaining uh, architecture from the Tang Dynasty. So that's the uh, importance of this, okay. And then uh, what I have done uh, is something like this. Then I will raise as a criticism, um, because this thing is too subjective. Um, well, then that's something I want to discuss uh, this morning uh, of the three uh, words. Uh, one is the criticality, another one is heritage, and another one uh, is the involvement. Uh, if I am a pure uh, historical preservist, then it's not a problem, you know, just to make something as it works. 
but you know, since I'm hired as an architect, <laughs> that seems like you know, like I have to do something to it. Uh, so this is what I call the involvement, and the involvement uh, is inevitable. Something very very subjective, right? And how can you judge uh, your intervention is something uh, right? So that's something of the criticality. So if we go back to Kant, you know, uh, in his terminology, the criticality is not to criticize something, but it's actually it's a, ref a reflective examination of the validity and the limits of a reasoning capacity. Uh, so back to this uh, heritage, uh, this heritage actually you know, was not found until the late 1950s, when this big temple was relocated to this area because of the construction of a reservoir, uh, which will flood um, the original temple. And then this one is relocated in the same county. And then people found another old structure uh, in this village, not too far away from uh, this place. Uh, the, so that, let's say, you know, like the authenticity of this temple, uh, which uh, can be found in this kind of photography, uh, is something like this. And in front of the temple, uh, there's a pond or a spring. Um, so then it explains why this temple is called uh, the five dragon uh, or the fifth dragon, uh, because dragon is in charge of uh, water. And uh, in the old days, uh, actually uh, this kind of temple of the dragon uh, functions as a, a weather broadcasting uh, institute. So it's a necessary part of the people's everyday life. And also, you know, uh, the building itself is in the middle of the field. It's so close to religious um, daily life. And so this place, because it's very, very remote and uh, it's pretty hard to access. Um, so even I was educated as an architect, you know, architectural students, and uh, in my knowledge of my college, I never ever heard about this. And this building was spotted by another gentleman, uh, he, uh, Mr. Dean, he's a vice, uh, senior vice chairman of a big developer, uh, Van Kee. And uh, uh, he is also a lover of the China's old uh, architecture. And uh, so he found this place quite interesting, but you know, he told me, you know, like uh, the building is in a bad shape and uh, he might invite me to do something good for that. So we meant to see this one, and I was uh, with that kind of expectation, uh, such as you know, like when we when you read uh, some or the, the writings by Walter Benjamin, you know, he will mention the aura, and then you know, like when you first encounter this building, so this is the aura but like that. So actually, it's not uh, something you know, as uh, you know, you 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 will think this is a you know, very prestigious um, building, but indeed, it's in a dark yard. And when you go up to this level, uh, there are two buildings. In front of it is a theater stage. And this theater stage was constructed uh, like uh, in Qin Dynasty, uh, not very long, only like a two to 300 years ago. And uh, this stage is to perform uh, plays to please uh, the dragon king uh, in the temple itself. And then you go to the level of the temple, the temple is in such kind of uh, bad shape, okay? Uh, so that was not too long ago, uh, <clears throat> ago is uh, in the year uh, 2013, um, nine years before. Okay. Then uh, after that, you know, we did a proposal uh, how to improve the environment um, for the local government, and then we didn't hear anything uh, from them. I have heard, you know, the temple itself is restored by the government, uh, by the antique uh, bureau. And then when we went to see uh, it again, and uh, uh, we saw uh, the new temple uh, like this, although it looks new, but anyway, you know, in terms of condition, it's much better. But when you go back to the front of the temple itself, uh, it's still a junkyard. And this is something, you know, of the environment about, uh, about them. So we really want to do something, and uh, there's an opportunity can, um, which is uh, the Milan Expo uh, in, in the year 2015. And uh, the developer, Wanky, uh, they invited Daniel Lieberskin uh, to design a pavilion in the Expo. Um, so after the uh, Expo, 
uh, this pavilion will be dismantled. And they think they should do something good um, for, uh, you know, to have a legacy of this kind of, uh, of, of this pavilion. And they decided to do a uh, crowdfunding to sell uh, the tiles of uh, this pavilion and to collect the money to, and to use this money to do a nonprofit um, work in China. Uh, because we have this uh, proposal already, and we propose to chairman of Wangqi Wangshi, Ms. Wangshi, and uh, he uh, loves it. And then, you know, like uh, we propose a uh, long plan, uh, long uh, in Chinese is also called long, uh, which means a dragon. Uh, so long plan. So we, we try to use uh, this kind of crowdfunding money and pass, you know, the uh, investment of the uh, bankers company uh, to do something uh, to improve the environment for that building. Okay, so uh, we did lots of things and also uh, this is a good process. Later on, I want to uh, discuss in the Q&A session, uh, you know, uh, because crowdfunding actually we didn't collect that much money, but good thing is that, you know, like uh, you let lots of people know this building and also uh, you, uh, you, you know, like uh, you raise people's interest uh, in doing such kind of thing, preserve historical uh, monuments. Uh, and then this is the uh, proposal we have. And, uh, you know, as our architect, you know, like uh, what we can do is about space, but it's not only about space, but also about time. And the space uh, is related to time in terms of, you know, like uh, if you provide a longer sequence of the space and then you can prolong uh, the time. Uh, because, you know, like uh, when we first came to this place, the tunnel is not um, constructed yet. So we have to, you know, like uh, uh, go across a mountain, big mountain. So it is almost like a, a day to be there. But when you go to this place, you see uh, this singular building and you stay there for no more than five minutes, you know, because you, you will totally lose your interest uh, of seeing this and then uh, you, you, you leave. So it's not worthwhile to come. Um, plus another thing is like, because these are historical monuments and uh, there, it, it is impossible for us to do something more. And uh, there's also a protection zone for this one. And so the only thing we can do is outside of the protection zone, we slightly increase the original wall for this and then make layers of walls and then create lots of spaces. And then, you know, when you enter this one and so, um, so this temple is not uh, encircled by original red uh, wall, but it, it's actually, you know, like uh, encircled by lots of spaces. And another thing is like uh, uh, after doing this, you know, like uh, as right now, you know, it's uh, in retrospect, um, this project, you know, I have to answer the question why our solution is correct. So uh, I'm borrowing um, Ken's uh, theory uh, of synthesis uh, to validify you know, my reasoning uh, in three steps, uh, you know, as mentioned by Ken. Uh, the first step is the synthesis of apprehension in intuition. And the second step is synthesis of reproduction in imagination. And the third step is the synthesis of recon <coughs> recognition uh, in a concept. And the most important is the third step. Uh, which means, you know, like uh, how can you prove what you are doing, uh, your involvement is correct. Okay. All right, so let's see the, um, the error view of this one. And I do believe, you know, over the uh, past a thousand years, you know, this one doesn't change that much, the village, uh, religion and the temple. But if you lower your uh, eye level, you, you see this one, it's totally changed. Um, so this is, something you know like you have to when we, we take the first glance of this one you know we have to make a judgment so what's our intuitive feeling and the uh, discovery of this one actually it's quite simple you know as i mentioned you know like uh, here you know the, the pond is gone because you know the in water level and overuse of the underground level and so the water is gone so the water, water is gone means you know the dragon king is gone and plus, you know, in today's material world, you know, we don't believe in any kind of spirit, uh, spiritual things. And, the, and the, the worst thing is actually uh, is the historical preservation because when this building is enlisted into the 
uh, national list of the national monuments. And then they built up this wall. And this wall, not, you know, actually is not to fence uh, thieves or, you know, some kind of dangerous uh, factors, but actually it fences off uh, the villages. Uh, over the past thousand years, you know, villagers co living with uh, this temple, but now they're gone. So then the villagers, you know, made this one, uh, uh, this lower um, pond, uh, dry pond uh, area as their, their uh, junkyard. So our solution turned out to be very, uh, you know, clear and uh, uh, very, very intuitive. Um, in the sense that, you know, like uh, we provide uh, this plaza to re-invite people to come back. And uh, we provide this kind of routes to let people get into the space. Although we still have a, a fence, we still have the fence wall. But it's accessible. It's unlike before. It's not accessible. Whatever. Okay. And uh, so you know this kind of mark originally this center, but then it turned out to be a margin, and then uh, this center comes back. Uh, so this is original um, uh, picture, and uh, this is later on. And uh, originally, you know, you have to access from uh, this route. Um, it's not very comfortable. So we provide uh, this kind of uh, steps uh, leading the people going up. And also uh, this is a cave um, to raise uh, cows or whatever. And, and then we reintroduce this one and uh, clean it up and make this one as a resting place for people to gather in the court, uh, uh, in the plaza. Um, okay, all right. So, and this picture, uh, shows you know, uh, you know uh, this kind of uh, pilgrim, <coughs> pilgrim and going up over here, and uh, uh, when you go into the space, so we do not uh, allow people to see the building first. Actually, we go to a pre-function hall, something like a you know space in front of a multifunctional hall, whatever. So this is an educational. Uh, space and it tells you, you know, history of this building and give you uh, sufficient uh, knowledge uh, to uh, let you go to the second um, phase, appreciate the building. And then this second uh, space is something uh, like this. So this is a pre-functional space and you go to the second space and then immediately uh, you see uh, the building. And this is actually uh, the intuitive feeling when I first uh, stood uh, on the side. I saw this side um, elevation of the building, and I think we should use a uh, one-point perspective to concentrate on this, and then also, you know, uh, on the flooring, uh, you you create this kind of slightly going up, um, uh, ascending uh, station. So this is my first uh, intuitive sketch, in the modeling, and uh, so this is the real picture, and this is actually I'm standing. Uh, I, I was uh, staying here to do the real sketch of this one. So uh, they're quite similar. And then after uh, this phase, uh, you have to go uh, access to the temple itself. And how to make this one? At the very beginning, you know, I just put some you know, stones over here because this is a very muddy uh, ground and we put a, a very small a stone uh, to cover it. But then, you know, uh, in the construction, we. Uh, we change idea. You we just make people to step on the stone because this is a place where we're uh, remote and not very much people, uh, many people come here. Uh, so when you go to this place, it, uh, place it's almost like a, you are the only visitor. So I want people to uh, listen to the voice of their steps and then uh, you enter the space. You actually, you not enter a physical space, but it's more or less like you enter into a mental space. Uh, some people uh, also criticize us as, you know, like, uh, so this is more like a Japanese uh, Korea, something because uh, Japanese, they prefer a uh, white stone. But indeed, you know, like uh, later on, this kind of wild uh, flowers will grow and uh, so it will be something like, like this. Then, you know, so this is the a new uh, scenario and this is the old one. And we changed the color of the wall before it was uh, in this kind of very sharp uh, red. And, but now we make a new material uh, for this one. Make 
uh, you know, uh, the building very, very much uh, coherent with the uh, uh, surrounding environment. And also we create another asset because in China's um, traditional architecture, normally, normally there's no like a double uh, axis. It's only like a one axis, uh, but there's no another, uh, you know, crossing axis. But, you know, so that's kind of uh, invention by us. Uh, also, of course, lots of criticism uh, for this. And uh, as we mentioned, you know, like uh, in the old days, um, this theater stage uh, is for the play uh, to uh, please uh, uh, the god uh, inside the temple. So it's not for people, but today, you know, like God is gone. And uh, so we, 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 we do a much wider pavement uh, over here, but still, leave uh, the original one here, right? And and, and so this is uh, our term. Okay. And uh, um, mentioned uh, before, uh, it's only a singular wall. And after putting layers of walls, you know, we create uh, this kind of, you know, space after space. And uh, we try to use space uh, to make people to stay here uh, longer and uh, to stay here to various uh, different things. And then, you know, they will feel you know, like uh, lots of interest uh, in staying uh, uh, in the courtyard. And also uh, this kind of uh, session, cross session showing the ascending uh, route and uh, at the very end, uh, before uh, it was something like this, you know, you, you, uh, you won't see anything outside of the courtyard. Um, now we provide this kind of observation platform uh, over here and then you, you stay here and actually, there's another historical remain over here. So you can see the whole um, uh, environment. Okay. So this is a basic um, you know, intuition where we see the uh, site and uh, quickly have a solution. And so this is uh, at the very uh, first uh, step of uh, designing. But then another thing is like, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, we can uh, come to this place really, really, you know, the the reality is kind of boring. So, um, so the second step is actually what uh, I mentioned uh, the synthesis of reproduction in imagination. And then what kind of thing you can imagine? Uh, we came up with the idea of, okay, so since you know, um, this um, building you know, has such a pre uh, prestigious uh, status in the history of China uh, architecture, why not make it as an open uh, Chinese timber architecture uh, museum? So we infill uh, all these kind of places with uh, lots of contents. And these contents actually raise uh, what we call uh, now is a augmented reality. And uh, this augmented reality actually, you know, that we can find lots of um, inspirations such as uh, the tablets uh, in Rome and, uh, uh, you know, like people do this kind of one-to-one uh, -one scale uh, uh, inscriptions on the core uh, uh, for the construction of Gothic architecture. So uh, we use the same method uh, to make a one-to-one -one scale uh, section of the building and also tells all these kind of uh, darkness terminologies of um, the, the buildings. And actually it's done, you know, very hardly you know, by uh, this lady and manually it's not done by um, <clears throat> any kind of machine. And we also, we don't have any kind of, you know, like equipment to uh, to, act, uh, to trace um, uh, the profile of this one. So we just do it in a very stupid way, you know, like we printed it in so many different sheets, um, especially in the content, there's no uh, A0 size uh, sheet. And so we, we, we have to uh, collage all these kind of uh, small sheets together. And then in the end, we go into the first uh, pre-function uh, courtyard, and not only you see uh, this timeline of China's architecture, but also you have one-to-one um, -one, uh, scale uh, understanding of the building over here. And so, so this is a very, very good um, uh, educational uh, content um, about the history. And secondly, uh, we also have lots of spaces and uh, nearby there are so many uh, historical heritages. And uh, so we want to make this one as a, a place, you know, like uh, when you come here, you know, you know much, much more information about others. And then maybe you can rent a bicycle, you can go to somewhere else, you will see more. Uh, so we did a mock-up uh, of this kind of exhibits and then later on made this one. 
And to our surprise, you know, like uh, with, we kind of thought, you know, like uh, only uh, tourists will be interested in this, but actually local people, they're very much uh, engaged in reading all this kind of information, uh, which means, you know, actually help them to enrich uh, the knowledge of their uh, homeland. And thirdly, um, we do a courtyard uh, for Chinese dogo, this kind of bracket. And so it's uh, elements in China's um, uh, timber architecture, but when it was put on top of the column, you, you don't sense you know, how big this one is. But when this one is put on the ground, you, know, you, you, you have a, you know, uh, another kind of you know, this. So we, uh, in this courtyard, we make like a four um, brackets of the oldest uh, Chinese architecture. And, and, but, and uh, although it's for educational uh, purpose, but actually it will turn it boy, uh, for data map, whatever. Uh, so uh, this explains you know, the um, uh, augmented reality uh, we did uh, for, for this reality. And then uh, the next step is to check you know, whether you know, our discount involvement is correct. You know, we're also very much dubious about this. So, but you know, we, we have to do this kind of synthesis of recognition in a concept. Uh, for example, uh, so what, 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 what the concept is? Um, so for us, uh, I mean, we are doing uh, something rituals. So the concept is actually the special justice. Uh, whether this one is coherent with the environment. At the very beginning, uh, when we saw the local construction, we think, we, we, we thought, you know, like uh, the building, uh, the new material should be something like this. But what this one is, uh, you know, in the rendering, it looks like uh, the rain, uh, earth uh, construction. Uh, I, I believe later on, uh, when you look, uh, she will um, illiterate uh, their practice. And so those are the real ones. But for us, in terms of uh, timing, in terms of lots of things, it's impossible to do, do this. Then uh, we work with the uh, GRC uh, manufacturer uh, to develop this one. Uh, so they're using the form uh, manually to create this kind of textures. But unfortunately, you know, like uh, in the factory, you know, it looks pretty good. But when you put in the real scale, you know, you, you will see all these kind of repetitive patterns, uh, which is not, uh, it's too busy. Uh, so we have to invite their workers to come to the site. So this thing is done half, halfly um, by uh, machine uh, in the battery, but also uh, halfly by this guy uh, on site. Uh, the good thing for this one is actually it's a paneling system, and uh, actually it fulfills uh, the requirement of historical preservation, uh, which means you know if we use this kind of retractable system later on. You know if we're not doing something correct, uh, so it can also be demolished to return the site back to the um, original uh, authenticity. And also, uh, this is a system which can integrate uh, other artworks uh, in the display. Okay. Um, but we are also criticized by this, and uh, I'm not, uh, I was not quite certain about this until one day during the construction, I went to Spain and I saw this building. Uh, to my surprise, at, at the very beginning, I, I thought, you know, this is stone. And then um, one minute ago, I, I, I went back to this building because I realized there's no drawings of the stone. So it's actually all painted. Then, you know, uh, I was pleased because, you know, the, um, Although we are also doing something like this, but I think you know what we're doing is correct. You know, it's not a matter of the force or real uh, construction; it's a matter of something else. Okay, and uh, we will have this kind of materiality um, in relation in in a good relationship well, with the nature, with its uh, environment, and also you know we have to in, uh, reinvite back uh, the varieties. But before you know, like uh, local people just do something. This I mean, you won't. After you go into a temple, you you won't feel any kind of respect uh, to these gods. So we ask people to redo this, and um, uh, we, we have not only the dragon king, but also have four other uh, uh, deities in charge of uh, lightning, rain, wind, thunder. So it's all about uh, this kind of rain or water uh, stuff. And uh, after we finish. This one, we, we have the outer, uh, we have, you know, like uh, five um, uh, gods over here. And the, uh, the 
local leader, uh, he came and he, he was very, very pleased about this. And he gave a very good comments. Uh, he said, you know, like uh, after uh, this, you know, the building does not seem very small because actually the building is very small. And the guards uh, do not seem, you know, do, do not look very, very big. So, which means, you know, the relationship uh, in terms of proportion and scale uh, is cor uh, correct. And uh, of course, you know, the most important thing of, about the special justice is the co-living with the religious. And uh, uh, so you can see like before, like people even don't have a place uh, to sit, but, but now, you know, we've got so many uh, places uh, for sitting. And, uh, okay, so let me just uh, show two pictures of before and after uh, in terms of the community. So this was before. Uh, the village uh, does not have a cement road, but simply because, you know, like uh, we sponsor uh, the upgrading of the environment of the temple, and then this one turned out to be a very, very, you know, eye-catching stuff, and the local government paid the money uh, to rebuild um, the, uh, the road, to pave the road, and also, uh, you know, to uh, paint uh, the buildings, whatever. So before it was a junkyard, but now uh, this is almost happening at the same place. So they not only, you know, clean up uh, the space, but also provide lots of public uh, uh, facilities um, uh, for sporting. And uh, also our um, long planting, you know, like every year we will revisit uh, the place to, to check whether uh, it's still in a good condition. And then we do lots of words. We pray to the gods once again, we plant new trees. And so this is uh, like a three consecutive um, years, you know, I uh, meet with the same uh, keepers uh, of the temple. Uh, very interesting. And whenever we come back, we will invite the local uh, theater uh, to come, you know, like to, well, of the local uh, theater. And uh, of course, you know, uh, it attracts lots of tourists and also uh, it's a place of kids to play now. So it's part of their uh, everyday life. And uh, uh, the long plan also developed into something more. Uh, you know, like last year, Miss um, um, uh, Dean helped to uh, establish a nonprofit uh, foundation. And this foundation sponsored something such as, for example, like uh, uh, during our first construction, uh, so we put all these kind of tablets uh, on the wall, but it's not protected by any kind of uh, canopy. So last year, uh, we did uh, a small canopy over here to protect uh, these tablets. So uh, in summary, uh, I have uh, mentioned like uh, three original steps um, this kind of synthesis uh, approach. And the most importantly is the synthesis of recognition in a concept. So I want to compare three uh, different approaches of the historical preservation. And the one, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, it's polite to call, is actually those people you know, who are against us, against our approach, uh, I would call them extreme fundamentalist. Uh, what they want is, you know, like as found, you, know, you you just don't change anything, you know, until the whole thing collapse, you know. So that's not your responsibility. You if you add something contemporary, you know, something new, you know, then uh, this is your original thing because you don't have a good will to treat uh, the heritage. And uh, in the neutral ground uh, is this kind of author authoritative. Um, uh, uh, measurement um, in terms of you know like uh, what they're doing is something called political um, correctness. Uh, so what they want to do is just simply you know like uh, make building uh, sound and make the heritage as it used to be. But uh, as I mentioned, because I'm my, my role basically is an artist. You know, if, if I was uh, I am invited to do something, you know, I have to be involved then uh, I will call our uh, approach is something like a critical involvement. So we want something is not as it is what was in, but it, uh, as a becoming thing, you know, because things is in the reciprocal um, uh, cycling. Uh, so it has its past and in our hand is our present, but 
most importantly uh, is the next step, what the future is. So we don't believe, you know, uh, a heritage is in the dead uh, or mummy uh, uh, status. Uh, so it's always in the, it's still in the uh, status of a life. Um, so uh, based on this kind of understanding, uh, we actually we have done so many uh, historical uh, building uh, or heritage uh, preservation and things, but uh, in a uh, general sense, uh, we almost um, are taking the same uh, approaches. Um, uh, for example, like, uh, so uh, this is a uh, old, um, uh, is, is archeological uh, site with, with such kind of, um, you know, like a, a plaza as a mark of the site. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't work for, for the environment and we, we use, but we cannot demolish this and we use a cave to cover it and to make the, the thing to dialogue with the nature and uh, to arouse people's interest to experience this kind of primitive um, space. Uh, so this is a temple uh, uh, in the demolition uh, site. Uh, and then the, we rescue uh, this small uh, pavilion over, uh, over here and uh, uh, actually, you know, we, we did not do something you know, like uh, uh, repented or whatever, but we, we, we made this kind of uh, permit uh, to make people uh, to stay here, to see uh, the environment, whatever. And so this is a, a warehouse group, and we just um, finished the renovation and turned out to be something like this. Uh, but so generally speaking, you know, the, the all process and the logic behind are uh, about the same. So we want the heritage has is in heritage. Okay, thanks. Wanghui, thank you for this amazing presentation, this deep dive into the, the uh, Five Dragons Temple, which was just so uh, eye-opening. We I, I knew the project from before, but it just, you gave us a whole new look. So many themes are coming up that are uh, resonating among the, the presentations. We'll turn to those later. Please, a reminder to everyone to put your questions in the Q&A so that we can turn to them after the presentations. Um, thanks again, Thank Wang Hui. Um, we're going to turn now to Lu Wenyu, uh, co-founder of uh, Amateur Architecture Studio. Uh, mm -hmm. Lu Wenyu is an architect uh, and practices with Wang Xu in Amateur Architecture Studio. Um, and together they also founded the architecture, the department at China Academy of Art in 2003. Um, they have a, both a, a practice as architects, but they are also very involved in education. Uh, Lou was a visiting professor at Harvard GSD, at MIT, uh, at UCL. Um, so really trying, she's been really trying to build these bridges to the United States and, and, and con exchanging information about architecture and preservation across from the United States and in, in, in China. Um, she's completed a number of uh, projects, uh, including, of course, but not limited to the Ningbo Historic Museum, the Xiangshan campus of the Chinese Academy, Chinese Academy of Art, uh, she's done the preservation and renovation of the Southern Song Imperial Street, the Fuyang Cultural Complex. She's also worked at the renovation of the Wekung Village and the Lian Historic Museum. It's a very long list that I will not um, get into because, you know, of course, we've asked our speakers to focus on uh, a small number, one or two uh, projects, um, but you know, of course, that their their uh, portfolio is is um, very rich and quite quite deep. So I invite you all to look at that um, in your own time. Um, I want to do. I, I do want to uh, lift up and um, and and call your attention to uh, her recognition in the field. She was awarded the Schelling Architecture Prize in Germany and an honorary award at the Venice Biennial in 2010. She's been listed among the RIBA's uh, uh, 2015 fellowships. Uh, she was the recipient of the 2019 gold medal of Tau Sigma Delta, 
And um, she's also very involved in service in preservation. Um, and recently as the juror for the UNESCO Asia Pacific Awards for Cultural Heritage Conservation. We're very pleased to have Lou Wenyu with us. Uh, and without further ado, I'll turn over the virtual a podium to her. She's going to be speaking in Chinese and uh, will be uh, translated uh, by one of her um, assistants um, uh, who is ne ne next to her right there. We see half, <laughs> half of them. So uh, thank you both for joining us. Um, I'll turn it. Okay. Okay. Can you, can you hear the, can you, can you see the presentation? Yes. It looks okay. great. Thank you. Thank you, Jazz. Um, 我用中文讲。今天我想通过我们平行在城市和乡村做的两个案例来讲讲。Today uh, in this lecture, I would like to talk about two projects we completed uh, in parallel, one in the city and the other in the countryside. 对于未来, 建筑师能做什么, 怎么做, 有选择吗? What can architects do for the future? Um, how, how, we, how we do it? And uh, do we have a choice? 什么是城市的未来? 什么是乡村的未来? 我能改变什么吗? Uh, what's the future of the city? What's the future of the countryside? What could we change? These are also the questions we need to think about before we start the project. Uh, the Southern Song Impro Street, uh, a main street built for the capital of the Southern Song Dynasty, uh, it has a history of 800 years. 早已经面目全非，残破凋零。It uh, was in a state of broken and disrepair. 嗯，我就讲讲当时我们是用了哪些主要的策略和方法来做的这个项目。I uh, will talk about the main strategy we used uh, uh, when we designed this project. Uh, during this project, we introduced some uh, unusual concept of historical street preservation. In这条老街的保护，我们采用了呃认为自南宋至今之前形成的都属于历史有价值的东西都应该在保护范围之内。uh, we believe that all what uh, all of what uh, formed from Southern Song Dynasty till today belongs to to the history, and uh, anything valuable should be pr protected. We uh, It was not suitable to uh, to choose a style from a certain time in the history and to adapt, uh, adopt it in, in, the, in, uh, in the entire street. Uh, this is the common practice uh, before, uh, before we start this project, how the government treated the, uh, all the other streets. In this project, we the uh, we eventually influenced the government's, uh, the local government's uh, decision making. Uh, uh, we should preserve uh, everything as we could. Uh, we did uh, a lot of research, investigation, and planning. Uh, we suggest the government to only make new buildings instead of fake antique. 做小建筑, 
用合适的小建筑介入，植入到合适的地方。And design design small buildings of the right scale in the right place. 重新建立了街道的形态，以复活整个街区。Uh, to re-establish new street forms, to revive the whole neighborhood. Uh, we try to reconnect the local culture in an in innovative way. Uh, 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 these photos show uh, what we did in this project. Uh, in order to maintain the diversity, we invited 24 groups of architects from multiple uh, architecture schools and institutes to join the design. We the the our studio was responsible for designing the entire street with buildings up to two story, including some small buildings, paths, and water system. We introduced water into the street and increased the number of trees to change the small environment and the microclimate of the street. 为了保留居民的日常生活，我们提出了对原街道的居民不能强制搬迁和改造。Uh, in order to maintain the daily life of the locals, we propose that the residents of the existing streets uh, should not be forced to remove. 所以影响了当时的地方政府制定出一个新的政策，鼓励外迁，允许自保。So this project later influenced the government to develop a new policy. Instead of forcing the residents to move out, they encourage those who are willing to move out and allow those unwilling to preserve their homes. Uh, to follow their own wills. Uh, in fact, this strategy was very successful. However, it made the design and the implementation more difficult than usual. So these photos show uh, during the construction, the life still goes on. This project started from uh, 2007 and completed in 2009. Now, it's been 15 years. We have a lot of design techniques and techniques and techniques. 15 years later, those design methods, renovation strategy, and concepts uh, have further influenced decision makings of many government authorities and the architects across the country. 也影响了不少地方政府对于老街改造的一些政策。Uh, have influenced many uh, policies uh, of different governments. 第二个项目是关于文村的改造。Uh, the second project is about the renovation of Wenchuan Village. 文村就距杭州城市两个小时车程的地方，是一个非常典型的不起眼的小村子。Uh, Wenchuan village is a typical and inconspicuous little village away from the city within two hours drive. Uh, this is before the renovation. Uh, before, the old village was demolished and built this kind of new buildings was shown in the picture. Uh, how we design a new village after we participate in this project? 
how to design and build a new village and how to protect and renovate the old village and how we can sustain the culture. Uh, the strategy we adopted at the planning level to continue the old village fabric and the density. The old buildings are preserved while the awkward new buildings built by the villagers have been demolished and rebuilt. The new village, on the other hand, is a continuation of the form that grow out from the old village. The new village can have a car. Furthermore, cars could drive through every house. Every household is equipped with one parking space, provided the necessary condition for the new way of life. In the architectural side, we convinced the local government to change the use of the land. At the architectural level, we persuade the local government to change the land use policy and add an additional courtyard. To each new built house in the village. 为了避免设计的概念化，我们设计了二十四种院落的类型变体，来对应老村，丰富多样的生活方式。To avoid over conceptualization of the design, we developed twenty four types of courtyard house variations, uh, corresponding to the rich and the diverse lifestyle. 我们使用的建材都是就地取材，保持其丰富多样性的状态。Uh, the building materials were all sourced locally, and the local building technique techniques were used. 我们使用当地的工匠和擅长的做法，他们自然也就加入到这个建造过程当中。Uh, so so that the local craftsmen naturally join the building process. 最有意思的是，这个村子开始建设后，周边的村民就开始模仿起我们的做法和材料。Uh, the most interesting is that from the beginning of the construction, the, the neighboring village began to imitate our material and building techniques. 在实施的过程中，我们创新了建设的三个方法。Uh, so during the process, uh, we actually uh, applied a new method through three steps. Uh, the first step is the construction So step one, uh, we use a professional urban construction team to implement the construction of new village at the fastest speed with high quality stands and quickly establish, establish a, a tangible example for the villagers. Uh, this is the built new village. We uh, So step two, uh, during the construction and the renovation, the professional construction team was responsible to organize and guide the local villagers to uh, implement the construction in order to teach them how to build during this process. So this photo shows the uh, status before the construction. So on the right side of this photo shows the step two. 
这张照片的左侧就是这个我们正在进行过程当中的第三步。So the left side is the step three. 第三步的，我们让村民用我们已经设计好的图纸自己去建设。So the step three is that the other villager will use the construction drawings we designed to build their own house, uh, which will complete by then. 第三步现在还在进行中。嗯、uh, ，So the step three is still in progress. 结果会怎样，我们也还不知道。So the result is still unknown. 呃，我们非常期待，嗯，第三步的完成。谢谢。Uh, we are looking forward to see the complete of step three. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lu Wenyu, for that amazing presentation and and uh, for putting um, on the table the whole question of working with 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 uh, local government to change land use policy as you rethink the um, the 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 ways in which you deal with traditional architecture and vernacular architecture, which is of course part of a, a major aspect of historic preservation. How do you preserve that and and uh, and move it forward. Super interesting. Again, a tremendous amount of overlaps here between the, the previous presentations that we'll get over in our um, discussion session, which is coming right up. Um, but first, we have our last presenter. Um, so uh, we are going to turn now to Pei Weiyi Chloe who is a Chinese Canadian born in Fuzhou, who grew up in North America and uh, traveled more than, than 50 countries and regions um, before starting her practice with, uh, her, she has a tremendous international perspective, uh, which really informs her research uh, into digital technologies for conservation, interpretation and dissemination of cultural heritage. She is the creative director of Tsinghua's Heritage Institute for Digitization. She is the vice president uh, of RE International Center for Digital Creativity and the founder of FX Cultural and Creative Studio uh, and To Be Continued. Um, she has working experience in various public and private cultural institutes uh, for international and national projects. And in 2017, she returned to China to join, to, to join the digital Yuanming Yuan project led by Professor Guo Daihing of Tsinghua University. And that's when she began her affiliation with Tsinghua's Heritage Institute for Digitization. Of course, the Yuanming Yuan is known to everyone around the world for being destroyed by French and British troops and known to everyone also is Victor Hugo's famous um, denunciation of that um, uh, act by the French and the, and the British against his own government, which led him to have to uh, uh, go into exile, in fact, uh, all of his uh, criticism of, of his own government. So that will be known to many people because of that. Uh, and of course, the work that she's done to to restore that digitally has been has been really groundbreaking, and gives us access to what that to what that garden was before that destruction. Uh, currently, she's responsible for the full circle of experience design and content research and value assessment to artistic interpretation and technical implementation of these interpretive projects. She's also in charge of international communications and exchange. Um, she is one of the core developers of the digital exhibition system for cultural heritage and has participated in designing, developing and implementing uh, more than a dozen national patents and original content. Um, in 2021, very recently, she founded the FX Culture and Creative Studio, which is dedicated to sustainability and the use of cultural heritage assets according to the current needs uh, of people and places, resources, and knowledge. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the virtual port podium over to Pei Wei Yi, Chloe.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I, I'm just going to quickly share the screen. And uh, well, uh, good evening and good morning, everyone, uh, no matter where you are right now in the world. And, uh, and for those who stay up late with us, and uh, I, I will try to make this as interesting as possible. So bear with me a little bit more longer. And again, I want to express my gratitude once more uh, for inviting me to this uh, French colloquial and to join this very inspiring uh, part of the conversation. And um, I think for the past, um, all the panelists that, that we had uh, previously, uh, we, we heard a lot of uh, perspective from the architects, from the creators and the interpreters of the space uh, where the, the space and the, uh, the building is acting as a median and the uh, moderator in, in, in the sense to bridge in between the past and the present and also the amplifier for the uh, local characteristic and, and the heritage. And um, coming from background as a curator and uh, interpreter, also a storyteller, um, I want to uh, shift the focus a little bit more towards uh, someone who inhabited and operates in a heritage space and then how do we use um, content and experience driven methodologies uh, to revitalizing that space and also to contribute into the community building and then identity building and then uh, just to forming the bomb uh, between people and then also uh, to encourage the conversation uh, between peoples using heritage as uh, as a tool. So, um, but uh, nevertheless, that we should start with something and some place that's concrete. Um, so let's begin with this photographs. I, I believe that if you followed just by a little bit about the past uh, Winter Olympic, which actually um, was very recently, and then today is actually the opening of the Paralympics, Winter Olympics. So um, amazing event. And you probably came across a photo shoot like this and then um, varied uh, striking images of uh, a slender figure of the athletes uh, just flying very light air and then agile almost. And um, wow, uh, against in the background, uh, against in the background is a very rigid and then the also very uh, robust uh, concrete structure uh, coming from the industrial. You, you may first uh, wonder as the industrial site. And then uh, that's actually causing many people to to wonder and then uh, foremost, uh, let me clear it out that this is not a nuclear plant, but what you're looking at, if we zoom out a little bit, is one of the uh, largest uh, industrial heritage uh, remains of uh, one of the, um, well, the largest steel plant uh, in China, if it's not in the world. And uh, we can see it from this, uh, uh, this aerial uh, view that uh, the big air shogun, uh, which is the, uh, the structure that's built for this uh, Winter Olympic is located at the uh, down uh, lower left corner, where it's uh, basically adjacent to four cooling towers. And in front of it, you will see a large pond that was used as a cooling uh, facilities for the steel and iron making process. And uh, next to it, on the other bend of the pond, you'll have the National Center for Winter Training, which is turning uh, uh, also adapt and reuse uh, project from the uh, previous uh, factory line. And then uh, you also got the, uh, the Winter Olympic Committee where they work at the varied uh, towards the northern end of the of the park and then right now and then uh, you also see it uh, in the, towards the um, the horizon there's a really like a green uh, mountain and uh, that's the Shizing Shan mountain and also give the name to the district and then beside it is also the river so the Yongding river that's uh, basically uh, embracing the entire site and uh, 
So uh, it's a very uh, unique combination of nature and uh, industrial heritage. And what we're seeing is actually only one fourth, uh, well, I mean, uh, a quarter of the site. And the entire site is at uh, is stretching over the land of 8.63 kilometers square. And uh, if we wanted to get some perspective, it's about 2.5 times of the uh, Central Park in New York. So if we zoom out a little bit more, uh, putting the context of the city of Beijing, uh, what you can see right now is that uh, Shogun Park is located at where on the map, uh, circling in red. And uh, that is on the uh, west extension of Chang'an Street, and which is that big uh, avenue that runs in front of the Tiananmen Square. And uh, what well, you can see that at the center, of course, is a historical center of Beijing. And then just spreading it from that center, you see and almost cross-like, uh, which actually it's the axis that defining uh, the, the city. And you see the north and uh, the axis that runs on the north and south direction. And that's actually the historical uh, central axis, uh, the one that's in the progress of uh, the designation of a heritage, uh, a UNESCO heritage site, it's along this axis. Uh, but then we also see one that's running uh, west and uh, east uh, on that direction, and on the on, and this direction is where uh, being designated as the uh, economy and then also the the cultural axis of Beijing and where you can see that uh, on the, um, the east far end and that's where the new administrative uh, capital of Beijing uh, where all the admins and the government sectors are moving towards that new town and then uh, on the west is where we see that the new landmarks of the capital of cultural revival which is the Shogun Industrial Heritage Park and so Basically, uh, under this entire uh, uh, new, uh, I mean, urban overall urban master plan of uh, revitalizing the, the West End uh, using culture as a catalyst. And uh, we actually being invited uh, to Shogun and then as uh, one of the catalysts. And uh, what we've been given is basically um, one of the silo space located at the very northern end. And if you can see it from the, uh, from the uh, legend uh, down at the bottom left corner and where I put that uh, golden pin there. And that's where, uh, so basically it's just adjacent to the Winter Olympic Square. And then, um, also very close to uh, what we call the five ring and they have the, uh, the, the metros running around it. And so this road of uh, Silo is actually among the first built structures on the side of Shogun. And then, uh, but the Silo itself right now is built uh, in 1992. And then it's a pure concrete structure that's used to store the raw materials. Uh, before they going into the uh, smelting process, and um, so here it's a uh, it's a very interesting space where uh, you can also see uh, from the inside that uh, the space has undergoes a little bit of uh, renovation and uh, and also rehabilitations um, because of its uh, adjacent to the Winter Olympic uh, Winter Olympic venue. Uh, that this entire uh, road of silos are dedicated to the golden sponsors of Olympic Games. So if you can see it, uh, that uh, the first two are uh, the actually the 5G um, broadcasting studio of the Tenzin Sports. And then next to it, it's a big data bank uh, for the data, data restoration. And then after that, you see Anta Sports, and then also uh, there's the Bank of China. So uh, this is actually a very creative, it's a Soho zone uh, where all the, uh, all the golden sponsors of the Olympics are situated. And uh, they're working uh, 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 creeks on site as well. But uh, all of the site, uh, all of other silos has been renovated and um, 
the interior has been changed to uh, adapt the new functions as office space, but only uh, silo four remains its original structure. So you can also see from here that uh, it's actually divided into, if we can uh, using the concept of floor, then the first floor is actually uh, the heritage space where it's kept its uh, original um, concrete structure. And then the second level and the third level, it's all built on a cantilever structure, which allows the bottom level to be uh, basically uh, structural free so that it's not supporting uh, the, the floors above and the floors are hanging up from a very huge uh, uh, steel structures on the ceiling. And then, uh, so those two floors are added to uh, giving uh, a more a useful space within the silos. Uh, but it does have a striking uh, interior uh, atmospheres towards uh, um, compared to all of the rest. And this is actually the only uh, silo uh, that's been kept in its uh, part of it, been kept uh, of its uh, original. Um, condition that's open to the public on the side of Chopin Park at the moment. And so when we first get into the space and then uh, what we were envisioned it uh, is uh, to use it as an incubator and then also as something um, that we will be able to uh, use it as a studio, but also uh, running tests. And uh, because, I mean, we've been uh, really straight focused in the field of digitizations, uh, the, well, the integration between digital technology and, uh, and uh, cultural heritage. And we know that um, some of the things that we do is quite new. And um, in order to persuade uh, the stakeholders uh, to perceive on this particular direction, um, there is more uh, proof than we need than just a PowerPoint or like a good story. So a prototype is very important to us. And not only so, but uh, we are also um, particularly interested in the relationship between uh, the audience and the contents. And uh, so basically using a, a 2C mindset to dealing with uh, exhibition content and not using the narrations from the upper above, but trying to uh, connect it with the audience and to see what exactly uh, are they looking for in, uh, in an exhibition like this. So uh, we basically uh, trying to uh, utilize in the space by three major uh, parts, I mean, the functions, uh, functional wise, by do, using it as a digital creative experience center uh, where people can come in and then they can try new things. And but also as a community service where um, we will using it as a platforms and a bridge to bridge in different uh, disciplines and then to bridge in different fields so that they have a space where it's not that rigid but uh, it, it actually encouraged creativities and open-mindedness. And uh, last but not least, and this is one of the very important function where we're using it as a R&D collaboration, uh, collaboration and also project incubations. And then, um, and because our close relationship with the, um, with the audience, uh, we are actually be able to run uh, much frequent uh, user evaluations and then to get a direct feedbacks from the people that we encounter. So, um, so compared to uh, many of other uh, uh, projects that we've done, uh, no matter is uh, the, the library, uh, I mean, the museum projects or the, um, the historical projects or the adapt and reuse projects, uh, the things that we try in the silos are or the, uh, the center that we're talking about, the International Centers for Digital Creativity, um, it's much more uh, experimental, if we can say it. And uh, we're trying to using a lot of things, we're trying to uh, actually um, uh, experiments on uh, installations and uh, on different uh, art artistic representations, we're trying to experiencing on uh, working with uh, uh, irregular forms 
And then uh, also you can see that this is uh, how the interiors are uh, for that, uh, the, the heritage space that it has uh, a concrete comb at the bottom of the silo. And then uh, this is actually a really interesting things because uh, uh, the, uh, this is a, a storage barn as we uh, know. And then, um, so the, uh, the iron ore and the raw materials, other raw materials, uh, they're actually being loading from the top. So uh, this, con uh, this entire silo is uh, free of windows. There's no windows except for a loading dock from at the top. So there's an opening at the top. And then uh, they will throw the, uh, throw the raw materials down. And then, um, so uh, one of the reason being that um, uh, for the iron uh, melting process, um, there's actually a very strict, uh, quite a strict standards in terms of the size and the mass of the raw materials. So, uh, but uh, many of the raw materials during their uh, transportations, uh, they are self flammable. So they have to be transferred on the open cartridge on the train and which often causing the, uh, the, the material to clot. And then so they need the gravity to basically uh, shatter those material once again. And then uh, having this shape at the bottom of the, um, of the silo actually helps the, um, uh, uh, the basically the, the material to fill the space better in terms of uh, the vast, uh, the mass and the volumes. And you can also see that there are uh, really uh, like metal plates that's on those uh, those cones, and just imagine that if it's water uh, pouring down from the top of the, and the water will basically deviate its route, and it's the same thing that goes with uh, uh, goes with the raw materials, and so you can see that we're trying to do a lot of artistic uh, installations and then uh, representations here, and just to. Um, uh, experiments on uh, the way that we can do uh, in terms of story, in terms of narrating, in terms of visual representation of the uh, of the cultural heritage, and this is the one that uh, a text run that we did uh, for one of the forty scenes in the Yuanmingyuan, and uh, this is Wu Ling Chunse, basically uh, a thing uh, directly uh, deriving from the the very famous poetry uh, Tao Hua Yanji and full of uh, peach flower, peach blossoms. So um, uh, we've been working with lights and sounds and then also a very calligraphy and then uh, uh, almost like a, um, a Chinese painting sort of uh, representations instead of a very real, realistic rendering of uh, the site and to see how they give uh, how, how to represent the sites? Can we give another layer of storytelling that help people to better conceive that ideas? And then uh, there's also a top level, which uh, it's almost uh, on the other end. So it's almost like a divide from the bottom uh, bottom space uh, where we'll be able to host uh, many uh, activities and uh, having a close relationship with, uh, with the audience. So um, just to quickly show a little bit so that you can actually walk. So you can see the exterior of the silos and uh, people actually, uh, this is how we get into it. So basically you, you're going from the outside and then uh, the entire space is circular. And this is basically the, the heritage space uh, where you can see that it's, uh, we, we leave it as it is. So this is a completely untouched and then um, uh, just from its original conditions. And then so, and also just to take advantage of that natural where they don't have light. And we turn the exterior into an immersive space where uh, we can, uh, I mean, the audience can appreciate the original texture and the uh, spatial uh, experience, but also the extra information is the digital layer, which lay on top of that, uh, of that really intricate space. And then uh, we're trying to generate something uh, that's uh, almost like creating a dialogue between the actual physical space and the content that's projecting on top of it. 
And uh, previously, you can see that there is the one thing where there are rocks falling down from that. And that's why uh, that's one of the programs that we're generating using uh, digital to imitating the previous function of this silo, uh, but in like a more uh, creative way. And just to help the people understand what the original function of this has been. And so all the content that you're seeing right now is some of the uh, other uh, exhibition that we did and transferring our previous uh, research results uh, into the uh, experience that can be uh, um, facing the public inside. And uh, we did uh, the one with Yuan Yuan. And you can see that in the previous, there, there is like a big water mill almost uh, that's been casting on the, the cone. And that's actually uh, uh, one of the things that we did for uh, the water structure of the Yuan Mingyuan and then also the one that we did for the center axis of Beijing. So uh, we did a lot of uh, experiments on that, uh, you know, experimenting the ideas about uh, digital twins and also to uh, stepping a little bit further uh, into how do we uh, implementing uh, the digital content and how do we uh, taking advantage and then of the space, but also working with the limitation of the space to making the content versatile and then to trying to figure out uh, a best practice for narrating and um, seeing how people responding with the different method that we telling the stories. And so uh, while we've been uh, invited into the park, uh, it has been over about two years now. And then uh, we, we actually uh, bring uh, many big uh, culture IPs into the west end of the cities. But again, again, we're coming back and thinking that uh, it will be invaluable and it will also be necessary for us to explore exactly uh, the, the value of the location itself, because it, it is unique as it is. I mean, um, and it also give that, uh, give that, uh, how, how, how did you put it? It's that the rights of being here. I mean, the, the existence, the rights of its existence. And then so um, that's why at the one year anniversary, of our uh, the founding of our center, uh, we launched the project of um, having a special exhi exhibition dedicated to the content of Shoba. And then so um, uh, the interesting thing is that um, we, we know that it, it is a huge, huge uh, uh, complex. And then we know that uh, it has a very, very long history and uh, but it's that the more we know about it, uh, then the more that we understand that it's it's so much more than just just a steel plant. It's so much, so much more. I mean, uh, the the complex uh, is starting out from a very, very little uh, steel plant, and then uh, actually, it's iron plant at the time. It doesn't have the capacity of making steel back in nineteen nineteen. So it just celebrated its centennial anniversary three years ago. And so um, during that process, it went through a war, it went through social turbulence, and it becomes one of the first manufacturers to back in work after the war. And they started to making productions. And then at first it couldn't, but then um, there's also endeavors making in um, uh, technical uh, advancements. And so gradually, it, it, it runs from a very small uh, iron factory to one of the top in China that can easily produce uh, 8 million tons of steels per year and um, also be one of the first uh, to, um, to launch its own stock and also one of the first to have its own bank and uh, to basically uh, managing the entire, uh, entire uh, company using the modern uh, management system and uh, also went through a lot of, and it's also the testing ground for many of the uh, really uh, renewal uh, uh, reform in terms of business modeling and everything like that. And so when people working in it, it's not just a factory, 
it is a society where you can see that uh, the service they have ranging from education, so from kindergarten all the way to college, uh, that's like a technical specific college that trains uh, workers that can go back to either the steel factory or metro system, uh, which has been extremely popular by then. They have their own set of supplying system, which means that um, they actually owns farms and uh, they, they own farms, they own OCHARs, they own uh, uh, basically uh, uh, farm in the sea, actually. So uh, they have their first hand resources of many of the products and they only serve to their own uh, workers. And then uh, they also have real estate. So uh, the, the basically um, the company developed real estate around it's planned to uh, for the uh, for their workers, and they not only have real estate; they also have retirement homes, they have hospitals, and um, uh, grocery stores, and uh, everything basically, and the entire different set of entertaining systems, where uh, it's just serving their own uh, own uh, own workers. So. After learning all this, and then I start to realizing that this is, uh, this is a society. This is a society that has influencing many people. Many people spend their lives in it, and uh, for a company as big as this, uh, it's inevitable that it's involving so tightly with uh, the history of the country, and especially that it's the steel production, and it feeds. Uh, its products feed into all the major ma uh, major constructions that's happening in the capitals, as well as uh, around uh, around the entire country. So um, the the rise of the company is inevitable, but also the the um, the, the the turning point is also very uh, dramatic in the sense that um, it is Olympic, uh, believe it or not. Uh, because uh, when Beijing first owns the rights to host it, the 2008 Olympics, um, the entire issue of environmental, environment uh, friendly, and then also about the clean air and everything's been brought to the table. And of course, a big steel plant like this, it's a lot, it's, it's a pollutant. And then it's a source of pollution. So then that leads to one of the largest migration of uh, a singular uh, factory, and then that dispersing to all over the country. Uh, there are people that's moving out of the cities, and um, there are thousands of families. Their lives are changing, and then, but at the same time, uh, Shogun is also producing uh, the. At the same time, they're also producing the materials uh, that goes into all the major structures for the. Olympics back in 2008. So uh, it's a very moving, uh, it's a very moving uh, uh, history if you look into it. And then how it was uh, much wanted and then no longer wanted, but then again, become a new source of inspiration at this turn of the count, uh, at this turn of the century where the Winter Olympic again uh, chosen the site and then uh, bring back all the lives and then give it another phase. Uh, and then now it's basically uh, one of the example of uh, social um, urban renewal and also uh, industrial renewal. So uh, when we're looking at this and then we, we, we start to realizing that um, our audience is gonna be complex. Um, it's not just, you know, uh, you know, for, for people uh, that's new, but uh, it is a contemporary uh, heritage where um, much of the people who involving in its entire history are still alive. And there are various stages of their lives. And then, um, but there are also people who, who never know, don't know about it because it move out if they're born after that, then you probably don't remember of seeing steel mill in Beijing. So um, when we're doing our, uh, our audience, uh, basically the audience profile at the very beginning, we're considered this as something that's um, 
long time no see, but also nice to meet you. It means that there are people going to find nostalgia for the concept, but there are also people that come in to learn about the new things. But what we're trying to do is to create the common memories for them to generating a platforms or like a foundations where they can start the conversation. So some of the strategy that we do, and then uh, it's uh, quite interesting now to think about it. It's uh, one of the, is uh, actually, this is actually one of the very first um, promotion uh, thread that we did. Um, and we basically are releasing it on the May the 4th, which is the youth day, the celebrating of youth. And we, uh, we, made, we, we make a small comic. Um, uh, uh, if you're interested, then I can post the link in the um, in, in the diagram, and so that uh, you can uh, you can have a look at it. So uh, this is basically a small um, where we make a avatar. Uh, we we basically we are creating a character, uh, but we intertwining his life with the rise and fall of the company. So he is also experiencing this as he grow older. And then um, it's also that uh, where he's, uh, he's feeling confident, the, the company is also rising, where he feels lost and then stressed, there's also a, a parallel that's making between a human being and the, the fate of the company. And this is a way that we're trying to, you know, bring people to feeling the warmth of the content. And what is interesting uh, of the result of this one is that um, we receive a very enthusiastic response and then from people that's coming from all over the age. And then this is when we're realizing that um, we've been thinking about uh, the nostalgia part too easily um, because depending on when, when did they evolving into, um, uh, uh, get involved into the, uh, into the, uh, into the story, uh, they're actually having different mindsets. So then um, basically uh, they, they can have very proud respondent towards the story, but they can also have a bittersweetness of feelings. So this is also that uh, when we start to realize that we need to get something um, not as a statement, but as a platforms where uh, people can come. And then as what I said, they, they basically they establish their common uh, beliefs and the common knowledge of the uh, of the content, and then um, they can basically um, moving on, and then having the space as an opportunity where they can generate uh, conversations. It's cross generation conversation between the parents and the kids. It can also be between the grandparents and their childrens that they, the story that they have hasn't been talking about. So uh, this is one of the strategy that we do for this uh, particular project. Uh, and I'm over time. I, I see you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I'm actually just gonna quickly wrap up then uh, because the, um, so what we did is actually, um, uh, I'm just gonna, uh, run through this. What we did is actually a system where it consider uh, a permanent part and the temporal part of the, of the exhibition, where the permanent part is the one that we said about setting up that baseline where everyone, uh, the basic idea, whether they want to get the fundamental information for them to generate a conversation. So um, uh, the one that we did uh, is basically uh, the history of the, the Shogun Park, but also uh, using the perspective of an iron ore. So uh, hey, we want to take them. some time for, for presentation, yeah. for discussion. Do you think you could wrap yeah. up? And, and... Absolutely. I, I'm just going to wrap up right now. So uh, for that, uh, for that, um, basically for the, uh, uh, for the entire journey. So this is a way so that they can navigate in through the entire, uh, entire complex. And uh, the other part is uh, the temporal part, which we changing monthly. And uh, each month we generating a new uh, theme so that people can come in and then using the theme as a catalyst to connect different part of Shogun 
inside that same uh, story. So um, I'm just not gonna uh, talk about the rest because this is uh, this is basically some of the uh, some of the um, the temporal one that we did, and then um, also the one we did uh, during the during the Winter Olympics. But uh, just to show some statistic at the very very end about uh, the approaches that we did, and then some of the things that we we may be able to do when we become so close with the audience is we can have uh, the statistic to show us how effective is our uh, strategies. And uh, one of the things that we are really um, uh, feeling delight of is that uh, it does attract people from a side of the uh, city. And then uh, a fact, in fact, uh, that over 70% of the audience are coming from outside of the district and which actually um, basically um, it's aligned with our strategy of um, re revitalizing this part of the city and then attracting other people from other cities uh, to come to here and then experiencing a different kind of vibes here. And that's it. And hopefully that everyone who's in Beijing, I, um, I uh, warmly welcome you to our site and so that I can give you a little bit more about the background. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite everybody that all the all our presenters to um, to turn their screens back on so we can turn over to our conversation. We, we, we now have about uh, half an hour left. First of all, just Thank you all for these amazing presentations. They, there's just so much there um, and, and, and that to unpack. Um, I know it's late for you, so I appreciate you, you know, staying up uh, late into the night. I think it's almost 1 a.m. in the morning. So uh, again, thank you. Um, so many themes that are uh, linking up over here um, in terms of your practices. And I want to also return to some of these um, the larger context in which all this work is happening, right? Like we have become accustomed to thinking about architecture, preservation, uh, um, uh, architecture in China as, as, as new construction. But what you are showing us is the possibility that preservation is now at the heart of a, of a new thinking about development, about a new thinking about not only urban development, but community development and a kind of development that is not reliant upon necessarily um, a tabula rasa, you know, clearing the ground and starting anew. So I wanted to turn to Wang Hui uh, very quickly because you laid out this idea of a critical involvement and in become as becoming. You know, there there is this, this sense of of um, understanding heritage as a continuity. I think this was something that came through in all of the projects um, that, that you as designers are deeply involved in the act of taking the past and making it relevant into the, for the present. And so in that there is, there is a questioning of what is the present? What does the present need? And how are you trying to change the present? There was something in your presentation, Wang Hui, that I think resonated with all of the presentations uh, uh, that, that really pointed to the fact that there's something missing in these historic sites. Many of them have lost their original function you showed us the temple of the five dragons had no long, you know, there, was, there wasn't a kind of religious practice that was organized around it anymore. And so the water was missing. And so you reactivated it. So this question of reactivating through design and reconnecting to, to community um, to me is very important. And I wanted to hear a little bit more from you and all of the panelists about the skill sets that you bring to the table to be able to make that connection? Because of course, we always center design, but many of you talked about connecting to community. And certainly in my education as an architect, that was not part of my skill set, you know, to understand the methods of working with a community. So how did you do that? How did you learn that? How did you, you know, what are you, uh, Lu Wang Yu, 
you were talking about collaborating with other architects, the, the notion of collaboration. So I'll turn it over to Wang Hui first to talk about that, um, how, you, how you connect with community. And also tell us more about this notion of spatial justice as a way of, you know, of, of working. Uh, that's a super interesting concept and we want to know how you're how you're thinking about it and i'll be reading also please those that, you, that are in the audience put your questions in q a and i'll be uh reading them off okay thanks um for a very very critical and a good question um yeah so first i want to go back to spatial justice um you know like uh, uh because we're architects so we're doing something of spatial so spatial is our means of changing the world. We have to use the space or you know, something related to space to change the world. Okay. And another thing is the justice. Okay, justice is a concept, you know, maybe you know if originally you can go back to Plato uh, when in, in Plato's you know the dialogue, you know, the, the Republic, it, it, the first thing is about justice. But justice in the old days is about something else. But today, justice is whether there's a um, fair uh, distribution of resources between you know, different parties. So th this, is, uh, this kind of fair distribution is more important today. For example, right? Uh, so let's say you know, China is under uh, <clears throat> the urbanization. And uh, so this is a you know, reallocation of the interest, um, you know, profit uh, between different parties. Uh, so who is the powerful and who is powerless, you know? So this is the first thing, you know, artists should be very much sensitive about. So normally, you know, like, uh, for, for, for instance, you know, like, uh, so this is a big topic. So let's go back to the historical heritage, uh, such as uh, uh, the temple uh, we work on, actually we are continuing uh, working on, on that. Right? So the temple has its original function, meaning whatever, but all these kind of meanings are gone. So we cannot go back to the old days, but the temple also has its own function today. Uh, so this function is not related to its original aura. So that's why I think you know, we should use those kind of augmented reality to reinterpret and or to recall uh, this kind of thing. Because Today, for example, like in the villager, um, the villagers uh, they go to the city uh, to as a worker, you know, like uh, to as a construction worker, whatever. So there are no more peasants, and uh, after they came back to, uh, to the village, uh, they only build their own house. Uh, each house is quite big, uh, is very, very wealthy. But then the public space is a leftover. Now you know, like uh, if we want to revitalize this temple, so actually you know is if we play you know, role of you know like re-establish a certain kind of justice. So the justice is to make a balance between the private and the, uh, the public. And this public space, if we don't uh, reinstall uh, this public space, and then there's no spiritual center in the village. So when we do this kind of temple, so we are not going back uh, to a deities, but actually we are going back to a sort of, you know, um, abstract spirit. We want to bring people together. So there are also lots of other means. For example, like uh, I, I didn't mention, you know, like uh, I persuade um, the biggest publisher in, in China to uh, donate um, over thousands of books uh, in the temple. Uh, so the kids, you know, normally, you know, like although, you know, uh, at, uh, you know, their families are not poor, but they don't spend money in buying books. So then we have a small library there. So we want to uh, invite kids you know, after school uh, so they can gather in the temple. So just like uh, their ancestors, you know, like, uh, so they gather in the temple, but they're, they were gathered in the temple to pray for the rainwater. But now the kids, you know, like uh, maybe they encounter uh, some, great books and then later on they will not stay in the village but they will you know like uh, in their future so maybe you know they will tell okay so something you know i know actually i knew you know, actually uh, originated from this temple from that book so uh, the place uh, the location the time whatever so they are all you know like merged together you know, as something you know like uh, with a certain kind of you know 
great power. Uh, but this power cannot happen in the private space. I, I, I will be, definitely believe, you know, this power is a public space. So um, to restore the heritage is not to go back to its original uh, authentic aura, but to create something, make a augmented uh, reality or augmented uh, aura. So uh, the, my last word is, you know, according to Ben, you know, like, uh, uh, some kind of heritage it either has its uh, ritual value or its display value. I think the, uh, these both are important, and uh, most importantly, you know, we should reestablish this such kind of uh, values according to our time, to according to our contemporary needs. I'll turn it over to Lu Wenyu, who uh, did a lot of work with the uh, community. There's a question uh, on the Q&A from Zihao Zhang that ties to this, um, asking, you know, you mentioned that in the Southern Song Dynasty Royal Street Project, you promoted local policies to encourage Aboriginal people to stay, uh, well, Aboriginal people, I think he means local residents, um, to stay uh, in in, at the place instead of kicking them out. And he's asking, did you think of this as a strategy before you started the project or did this come through the work itself um, as, you, as you did the project, this idea? Um, so this project is very complicated. Uh, uh, so I almost closed our studio uh, after this project. Uh, this是我們給當地政府的建議,是絕對不可以強制他們搬搬離,我們才接受這個項目的委託. And so uh, after the government accepts our uh, suggestion that the locals could uh, could stay or move by uh, by their own wills, uh, then we accept this project. Uh, uh, but we find it's it, it is we made a very big and uh, difficulty for ourselves. Uh, and so this suggestion before is actually before the the start of this project. And so we discussed with the local government a lot um, to, uh, about the strategies to uh, encourage people to stay or how can we move uh, how how these how those who are willing to move out uh, how this strategy could work uh, 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 and so we we could for example we will offer a larger house for the people who are willing to move out then the then the house will empty out for some local commercials that which is related to the uh, the street life. Uh, but the the old house actually live uh, uh, many many families are lived in the old house. Uh, but some people 
意见，就是告诉他们怎么办。呃、uh, ，some of them are some of them are willing to stay and some some of them are willing to move out. So we 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 will give. Uh, the local government some suggestions how to deal with this situation. Uh, 比如说我们给了一个建议，就是在附近的院子里，如果呃就是和他自己住的很近的地方，也有人愿意走，还有人愿意留，是不是可以让他们集中在一个地方去住，还是住在这样的一个老的区域里？嗯、uh, ，For example, uh, some 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 families who are willing to stay will move to the neighboring house. Uh, which have some empty place. Uh, 另外，政府也知道，等我们改造过之后，这个街区的呃价值会更高，所以他们愿意提供呃比平时更呃好几倍的这个呃价格给到他们，让他们可以愿意把他们的房子，就是和和政府给的房子进行交换。嗯 ，so the Also, the government knows that the street will be more valuable after the renovation, so they are willing to offer the offer the people more than usual. 呃，所以后来在这条街上，差不多可能有呃一半的人，最后的结果是他们自己主动的要求换到新的房子里去。And so. As a result, almost half of the local residents uh, are willing to move out uh, and moving into the new place. 还有一部分继续留在这个这条街道上居住。Some of them stayed. 嗯，但是等这条街道改造之后，那些给了很多倍价值的离开这个区域的人，他们后悔了。Uh, and but but after the renovation, some of the people moved out actually regret. 嗯，还要讲其他的吗 <laughs> ？That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, uh, uh, I, one of the follow-up questions that I have for for all of you, and but especially Lu Wen Yu, um, and also Dong Gong, maybe I'll turn it over to you. Is that I mean, the projects you all showed were amazing, and they are really um, seemed like the tip of the iceberg. Of, and I wanted to ask you, to what degree are these projects, in your mind, the exception or the rule? Of what is happening in China today, the 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 rebuilding of rural villages, for example, in Lu Wenyu's uh, um, examples, or uh, Dong Gong in your in your own work, this project, which so it's unbelievable, you know, this this um, this industrial um, relic, you know, this 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 historic building. Which is completely, it looks like from the images in the middle of nowhere and is being reimagined for this, what looks like a pretty high end hotel um, tourist um, destination. Is this the exception in terms of when you look, when you take a, when you go look broadly, you know, what's happening in China today? Is this the exception, or do you see a pattern here that this is you're part of a of a of a larger movement uh, to rediscover these these heritage sites and to create a new kind of tourist industry within China? Wu Lao, sure, you go first, or I can uh, go. Go ahead, Dong Gong. You haven't spoken yet, and then we can turn it All back. Right. To well, um, Based on my personal observation, I, I do have to say that uh, the situation is undertaking a very dramatic change here in China. Because if you go back to, for example, 15 years, when you ask the government or the real estate developer or some private owner about how they value their trees of the from their old time for example this building heritage i think it's not quite a satisfied period of time because under the tremendous pressure from this drastic urbanization seems like people are more uh interested in this quantity and speed but this is a situation back to for me it's before the olympic it's about before the 2008, but be between 2008 to almost like 2015, 
my personal experience of dealing with these clients and uh, also the authorities has been, uh, I can sense the change because I guess there are two reasons. First of, first of all, the speed of the development in China is slowing down a little bit. So we have a little bit free space to rethink about what, what we have done in this urban, uh, including suburban or rural area. Are we doing things uh, fits the real comfort and the quality of the regular life? I think that's not only about uh, the architect's discussion, it's the entire social concern from 2008 to 2015. And within the seven or eight years, I think there are some very exem exemplary projects coming out, uh, even though it's a small number, but it's very influential. So in the recent three or four years, I feel when, when we communicate or negotiate, negotiate with the government or client, is uh, less and less barrier in terms of how we see the old stuff. So I, I see a good change, but uh, it's not perfect yet, I have to say. Each project, well, I, I guess it depends on different situation. Architect is still in a role of this pressure and kind of passive. So what amazed me today from, especially from uh, Lu Wenyu's presentation, I think their effort is trying to get deep into this, the mechanism of the revitalization of a place. It's not the traditional role of design a space and form. And I can imagine how tremendous effort and endeavor architects have to pay, but, but I really appreciate that. Yeah. That's and this is something I, I feel very difficult as my personal practice. Yeah. 2008, of course, was also the financial crisis. Uh, in, and uh, how much of that impacted, uh, in your mind, the turn towards preservation? I think that's the reason why the entire uh, economic in China it's slowing down a little bit. And that might be a good thing in terms of how people value, you know, a place of time and building with time. Of course, it's related to the preservation issue. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's always good and bad together. Yeah. yeah. Um, I appreciate you um, um, focusing on uh, Lu Wenyu's work. And uh, I'm, I'm going to ask that of everyone on the panel you know, what, what did you find um, was a discovery or a valuable discovery in each other's work? Um, you know, what, I, I know you're very familiar with each other's work, but I'm sure today, you know, going deep into one of these projects, maybe there was, there was something that stood out to you. So I, I want to uh, make sure to, to, to hear that from you, you know, um, Okay, should I, should I start first? Of course, yeah, anybody. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, then I have known the Wounds project um, uh, from many venues, but actually today, you know, I was pretty much surprised by seeing, you know, like uh, how to make the uh, concrete block um, on site. And so, so, so that's, that, that's part, you know, I, I'm pretty much amazed. And uh, for Luan Yu's one, um, she mentioned, you know, like uh, when she took the project and uh, she asked uh, the local leader, uh, because, you know, this is a um, 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 historically can trace back to the Song Dynasty, but she asked, you know, uh, them to, to give her the right not to do anything um, historically, but everything should be in a contemporary way. <laughs> And for the last one, you know, uh, because council of information, you know, has already diluted, you know, my memory of this. But one thing, uh, I, I, I was, I was very much impressed because, you know, like, uh, 
uh, when she uh, re, uh, uh, when, when she uh, you know like uh, doing that kind of Yuan uh, stuff uh, digitally, uh, it's not uh, that kind of you know like uh, a pretty much concrete image. But uh, I remember you know vividly about that uh, flower, um, uh, you know like a, like a falling. Rain, rainwater, whatever, you know, so that kind of, you know, like uh, new things about history. So that's something uh, as an audience, you know, I, I will expect. Lu Wen Yu. Uh, uh, I think today, because I saw Wang Hui and uh, Dong Gong, and Bei, uh, they are all in the original, uh, that is, the heritage, one is the cultural heritage. 一个是那个王辉的那个是一个呃历史遗产，还有一个这个呃也是工业遗产哈、啊，北京这个，所以我我这两年因为一直在做这个亚太区的这个遗产的这个呃新设计奖和保护奖的这个评委，其实我我觉得一直我们都在探讨相关的一些问题，你先翻吧。嗯、um, ，So I I. I, I saw many projects relate to the uh, uh, industrial heritage, also the cultural heritage from Dong Gong's project, uh, Chloe's project, and also Wang Hui's project. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, be, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually the jury member of the UNESCO, UNESCO Preservation Awards in the recent two years. So uh, we are, uh, we are I'm, I'm looking very closely to this kind of project. Yeah. 呃，怎么样在这个呃遗产区做新建筑，其实是我觉得这些年大家一直都在探讨的一个、呃、问题。So the topic of uh uh um uh, relate the new designs into the heritage sites is a very hot topic in the recent two years. 呃，我我我个人认为，好的传承应该是基于好的创新的基础之上，只有创新才可以传承。So I think the good way to pass on the culture is, uh, is only by, uh, innovation and create, uh, and the creativity. 简单的模仿，它一定会死掉的。Uh, the simple imitation. Is not uh is only the is only a, an a dead end. So I today am very happy to see other three guests. They are actually using a creative way, using their own way, to design for the heritage area. So I think that every person will think of new materials, such as materials, or techniques. 做法也好，我因为董工的那个，我我也是第一次看到，他是用这个混凝土的这个模块自己去浇筑去做的。那王辉也在，呃，创新新的材料，在这个他的这个呃保护的这个项目里。So I'm very happy to see uh all the three other uh architects using their own method to uh participate into the heritage. Uh, also using uh, new uh, materials in a very different way, like concrete blocks, also GRC panels. So I think the good design, the good innovation, including the protection of the heritage, should still be applied to the design of the So I think the good design should uh, take in, into the last details of materiality, also construction. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Chloe um, to, to reflect on, on your panel, the other panelists. Oh, yes. I absolutely second Professor Liu's uh, comment on um, uh, we, there, there has to be innovations in making the longevity of, that, uh, of the heritage. And, um, and I also particularly uh, fond of uh, Professor Wong's uh, last statement about three classification of the three uh, uh, attitude towards uh, uh, heritage structures. And then um, I, I, I absolutely found that um, interesting in a way that um, 
I think there is a difference because I myself, uh, I also have an architectural background, but uh, I, I'm a conservation architect. So I was trained a little bit differently in the sense that um, somehow uh, in this particular field, I felt that um, people are pulling back a little bit. And then uh, it's a more conservative approach. I mean, uh, if you put it nicely, uh, they like to say it's a humble approach where uh, uh, it's less about the personal and then it's more about the, the heritage. But I think that um, it, it's not really whether or not it's a personal statement or not, but whether or not you will be able to take in the responsibility of making a critical assessment of that heritage structure and then making taking the effort of uh, guarantee its longevities for the future generations. And that means change. And that is actually going to be a very critical change, not just simply by altering it or just simply by inserting new materials. And I think one of the questions that uh, I saw in the Q&A uh, session uh, where it's addressing and asking about the future of digital preservations. And um, I think that, that I also second that, that it's changes needed. It's not a mirror imitations of what is left. Digital is never to meant to be a, a, a exact copy of the physical. It is actually a process of thinking because it is us, the humans who make those things. We make each single decisions. It doesn't really matter if we build in the reality or we build in the digital realm, but we are the one that making that choices and we are the ones that's processing all the informations. And either the architecture, whether or not it's a virtual one or a physical one, it is the manifestations of human genius mm. in the sense that if we do not continue, if we do not making that expression of our current era, how can we be represented from the future point of view if we are so timid and sitting back? So I think this is something that uh, also in parallel to respond to that particular question. And uh, it's just that um, also my greatest uh, um, respect to all of the panelists, uh, the green masters, for uh, having that courage and having that, taking the responsibility of stepping forward, of making the attempts, and then of making the active assessments and to, uh, to basically uh, contribute in the continuity of the cultural relics. And I, I've been honored, I, I feel honored to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Well, and some of the, but you raised the question of, um, of, of responsibility and um, there's a question in, uh, from Professor Erica Avrami that dovetails well into that. She asks, following on the comment about how the past is instrumentalized uh, by the present, in what ways are architects accountable for transferring certain ideas and values of heritage and knowledge over others through form, material, and process? How do designers and design practice or reconcile the choices about what is deemed to be significant or not when not all publics, not all members of the community might agree? Uh, Dong Gong, is that something that you would like to take up? I mean, when there's conflict, you know, how do you take sides in those interpretations? Have you had experiences like that? Well, I guess this might be relevant to the specific cases. Yeah. Uh, for me, actually, each place, when you design architecture or there is an intervention uh, for new architecture, it has a line of time already existing. You can see this is the life of a place. No matter it's a building heritage or it's topo, it's nature, it's all the conditions. It's a kind of existing condition. And for me, there's not much the difference when I consider a tree or there's a building because I think the new architecture has to take care of things on the site. But there might be some special cases 
uh, this is also my curiosity to uh, Wang Hui's project because when the si significance of the, the the building heritage is above a certain level, this might be uh, more complicated factors will be involved. If you if we make a comparison between my project, my building. Uh, I have to face is only with 60 or 70 years of history. So it might not be that much uh, classified by government and it's not protected by law. So it's up to the architect's decision or the client's decision. And sometimes it's very brutal, I have to say, but we do have some legal freedom to deal with that. So, but the case of Wang Hui, which is my personal curiosity, I guess because that building, as he just presented, uh, is the second oldest uh, building from the Tang Dynasty throughout the national history. So it, there must be regulations, right? I, I, I guess, because that this is in terms of the history, the level of the, you know, the importance it has to be some very complicated procedure that architect has to face if you want to do some innovation in this very sensitive site. This might not be the answer directly responding to that question, but this is definitely my curiosity. Uh, I have known this project for a long time and read a lot of articles, but still I'm very, actually I, I appreciate their, the, the architects uh, you know, it's it's a very brave intervention, and it must be a lot of fight, I guess, or battle between architects and all the what whatever. The, so, uh, can, can, I, can I take some minutes to answer your question? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Actually, you know, like uh, this is the biggest criticism because if this is just an ordinary temple, it's fine, you know, but this is such a prestigious uh, historical heritage. Um, okay, so my answer is actually very, very simple. Uh, why this building, you know, before I intervened, you know, like uh, it was, you know, less known, even for me, you know, as an artist, you know, like uh, with certain kind of knowledge, I never ever read this building in my textbook. Um, but now, uh, simply because, but I, maybe, you know, if I say it this way, it was lots of trouble for me because of my um, intervention, <laughs> then this building turned out to be you known by many, many people. And actually um, over a hundred thousand people, you know, visitors, you know, have been to this place after the uh, reconstruction of its environment. Uh, so this will go back to, you know, like uh, um, uh, the question of the spatial justice. Uh, number one, I I'll say what we have done is something retractable. I mean, uh, because we're using this kind of framing system. So it's almost like a set design. If because we, we, we do not damage, you know, the foundation that much, you know. And also before uh, we started our construction, we do some kind of archeological uh, uh, detect, you know, to see, you know, whether there's something important in the underground. And then, you know, we do have very, very deep, uh, you know, like a foundation for, for, for the ground because it's, it's a framing system. So it's just a set design. And then uh, I, I will, definitely believe, you know, like uh, in my generation, what I have done, honestly, is something, you know, like uh, we introduce this heritage to the world because, you know, before, you know, our intervention, you know, it was less known. But I definitely you know, hope, you know, after maybe not only 50 years, but even five years or 15 years, whatever, if there is uh, something, you know, more, you know, smarter, you know, or more appropriate, or after this stage, you know, like the uh, people, you know, may not necessarily, you know, uh, want to see this kind of dramatic uh, augmented reality that I create, 
So this is just like a, a set of play in my hand. And then later on, this plane can be removed and something will come back. And my biggest uh, expectation is actually totally demolished the, the wall because this wall, you know, even go back to the uh, photos in the late uh, 50s, right? Because, you know, this is not original wall. This is a wall after this building was enlisted as a national uh, historical monument. And then you have to make a wall to find, you know, the, the certain area, which is, you know, like defensive, or protective, uh, but it's not authentic uh, environment, right? The authentic environment is to totally get rid of all of this and then make this building as part of the agricultural field. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Dragon King, you know, who is in charge of agriculture, in charge of rainwater, you know, he will go back to his original agricultural aura instead of, you know, this kind of history of architecture, because architecture, you know, is not the end, you know, architecture is just a mean. So my understanding of our uh, intervention is, you know, is a temporary, it's not forever. Uh, thank, thank you. you. What, what did, did you want to respond to that? Uh, no, no, I appreciate okay. that answer. Okay. Um, there's just so much here to, for us to, to explore. And unfortunately, to, we've run out of time. And unless we want to keep going to a third day of the, of the conference, <laughs> I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up. And, um, and this hopefully will be the beginning of many more conversations across the Pacific Ocean and many more ideas cross-pollinating. You've put so much on the table. We are just so impressed by your work, uh, so thankful uh, that you, uh, for your generosity to share it with us and to unpack the, all the issues uh, in it. Uh, we've learned so much from you uh, and we look forward to, to many more conversations and collaborations um, between us. Um, thank you to everyone that attended the conference over, over the, the, the long stretch of time uh, over the two many time zones. We, we appreciate your, your participation. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions on the, on the Q&A. There's been a lot of Q&A questions. Um, uh, hopefully those can be answered later by, by some of the panelists. Uh, once again, um, just deep gratitude to MoMA, to Martino, to Evangelos for, for this collaboration. Please everyone go to see the show. Uh, at MoMA, and uh, uh, and I hope that um, that uh, this this will just be uh, uh, the, again the beginning of of much more um, cross collaboration between our thinking about preservation, about creativity, about the role of architects in heritage, uh, both in the United States and in China. So. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite the panelists to stay on the Zoom for a second so we can say a, a proper goodbye, but I'll let everyone else go uh, in the audience. So have a great day. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.